Good morning, colleagues. My name is Tuane Lo Tuche. I work for the Department of Health in the provincial office. I, I just want to welcome everybody in our Human Milk Bank seminar. I want to welcome all our provincial colleagues. I want to welcome all our national colleagues, even though some will join us later. And I also want to welcome in particular our partners, the University of Northwest, Professor Velma, and also SAPR, Ms. Stesha. I know if it wasn't because of you, really the summit would not have been a success. I want to thank everybody that is continue to support in ensuring that we perform in our neonatal outcome through supporting breastfeeding. This seminar has been aligned to our breastfeeding week theme, which is protect breastfeeding a shared responsibility. So our theme for our Human Milk Bank seminar is breastfeeding is a shared responsibility. And we are also having this seminar in the midst of the pandemic facing our country. This is where really mothers need to be supported, protected, and they need to be encouraged to breastfeeding. I'm hoping that everybody will enjoy this seminar and we're going to learn a lot from all the people that will be sharing information with us. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you, Tornello, for that wonderful warm welcome and making us aware of the breastfeeding um, topic and theme again for this year. I think this year we can do something for the province. And then in a few moments, I'm going to hand over to Stasha from the SIBR, the South African Breast Milk Reserve. She'll also introduce herself. So, Stasha, over to you so that you can start and kick off for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Valma, and welcome colleagues, um, both provincially and nationally. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to first of all introduce myself properly. Um, and my name is Tasha Jordan, and I'm the executive director and founding member of the South African Breast Milk Reserve. The South African Breast Milk Reserve is a public benefit organization that for the last 18 years has supported breastfeeding at the facility level through human milk banking. And how human milk banking has really grown has been very organic. And the reason why uh, we actually are, have come to a point of hosting this seminar is that um, oftentimes how the initiative grows is really on demand. So we will receive appeals and um, and, and requests uh, from the prov provincial departments of health, uh, from healthcare professionals practicing at the facility level that work with very low birth weight or extremely low birth weight infants um, or babies that are born prematurely in the public hospitals or the tertiary facilities of South Africa. And to date, we have been responsible for establishing or guiding uh, the um, establishment of 55 public human milk banks countrywide, both public and private. A lot of these facilities have then been part of reshuffles, both provincial reshuffles, as well as, um, you know, spin-offs of human milk banking. We are part of the broader human milk banking community in South Africa, which is comprised of a number of stakeholders there are a lot of uh, little independent human milk banks at the facility level. There are uh, human milk banks uh, that belong um, to the SABR uh, um, group of, uh, of, of facilities. And we specialize very, very strictly on the neonatal intensive care unit environment and the hospital environment. You have community human milk banks that look specifically at supporting children in orphanages or children that are born HIV exposed and are HIV positive and therefore benefit greatly from uh, breast milk. We have a sister bank in the Western Cape Milk Matters, um, the Netke and Kalisa banks. And so we are part of the broader stakeholder group that today human milk banks in South Africa. Human milk banking has been a practice um, in the context of informal milk sharing that is as old as ma mankind. But just as old is our relentless desire to artificially feed children. And part of the reason we 
thought it was really essential we hosted this seminar. It's because through my last travels, and I can assure you that there is probably one person that sees at least 80 neonatal intensive care un units a year, that is me. Um, I am seeing the first hand impact of COVID on uh, the ability to optimally lactate both um, for mothers that are breastfeeding their full-term babies and have to access the healthcare system, but even more so for mothers that have babies in neonatal intensive care unit and much, uh, and, and because we have to have access restrictions and because we have to guard facilities from uh, the spread of the pandemic. Um, what we have seen is that, for instance, mothers are not always allowed to anymore stay on site at the hospital or oftentimes uh, they are required to come in every day. So there are perhaps are not, no longer larger facilities available. There have been reshuffles as well at the facility levels where wards have been dedicated to COVID care. Um, and obviously this has impacted in, together with the reshuffle of uh, uh, human resource, the ability that we have to support mothers to lactate. And today the, 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 the objective of this seminar is that we would all come together as frontline workers and people on the ground and that we would share our common and learned knowledge of how best to support mothers to breastfeed. Um, how to um, get a human milk bank up and running in your facility, how to get access to donated breast milk. Um, you know, we proud ourselves in saying, in, in never declining any baby that requires donated breast milk. And so to this end, I'm going to run you first and foremost, I have probably the largest slot of this seminar because I'm going to run you through um, what are the guidelines uh, that support the safe use of donated breast milk. I will talk to you a little bit about the inclusion and exclusion criteria for breast milk donors as well as breast milk recipients. And, um, and then I will show you a short 23 minute video, which I would like you to look at as a benchmarking tool that talks about human milk banking, where we come from, some examples of why kangaroo mother care, skin to skin, uh, early initiation of lactation, um, and um, all these principles that uh, underpin mother and baby friendly health initiative are absolutely fundamental to uh, supporting lactation going forward. So uh, the, what, when people ask me at this point, where is the research evidence for this? Um, what, what I see as being a decline in our ability to support mothers to breastfeed from a number of logistical and otherwise reasons that are very closely linked to the pandemic. But by the time this becomes research evidence, it will be too late for breastfeeding. And, I'm, I'm, and to this end, what we want here is to put together a bunch of easy strategies that can help um, other facilities where uh, you know, in, in establishing and supporting lactation. And to this end, we would like to invite you to also please um, give us and share with us your strategies uh, to support mothers to breastfeed. Um, so currently we support 28 neonatal intensive care units in public sector only. We do not have any private sector human milk banks any longer. We do cooperate with the private sector and therefore we also supply a total of 80 neonatal intensive care units. Um, countrywide, both public and private, under what we call a universal guideline for accessing donated breast milk. Why a universal guideline? Because our organizational ethos is that any baby that is born extremely low birth weight, that is in the care of a hospital facility, has a right to access breast milk from the mother. And when that is not possible, that baby should have a right to access breast milk from a breast milk bank because that promotes the survival of the baby and to this end uh, we take a stance that we need to take a universal approach to breastfeeding promotion and therefore give equitable access to a resource which is otherwise very in, in high demand. So first and foremost what I also want to point out, and perhaps yeah, I, might, I might jump from pillar to post in my sharing. I'm not going to share a PowerPoint, but what really is really important to understand is that human milk banking is 
the, a broader part of a breastfeeding promotion program. There is no uh, human milk banking when there is no lactation. And oftentimes uh, I, 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 I'm confronted with healthcare professionals that have almost a, a pleading look in their eyes, hoping to find breast milk as if it were on tap, but that's not how it works. And so, you know, human milk banking will never be able to atone for our breastfeeding sins. And I keep repeating that, because we need to promote exclusive breastfeeding at the, at the neonatal intensive care unit level in order for human milk banking to touch sides. So, you know, when we have a one, when we have a neonatal intensive care unit and out of a hundred babies, 92 babies are receiving breast milk from their mothers and eight babies have mothers that are themselves hospitalized, unconscious on medication, which is contraindicated for lactation. That is the space where human milk banking becomes relevant because we can, we can leverage those 97 breastfeeding mothers and their babies and find amongst these mothers, mothers that are healthy without sexually transmitted infections that are not taking certain kinds of medication and enlist them in our support program for this um, universal coverage of breast milk across the entire neonatal intensive care unit. Why is that important? Because this is, where, and, and this touches on the eligibility criteria. Because babies that are born prematurely and extremely low birth weight are at high risk of sepsis and necrotizing enterocolitis, which is the second biggest killer in the premature population. And it is an infection of the gut, which oftentimes is directly associated with artificial feeding and uh, poor outcomes in babies that are developmentally compromised, often uh, HIV exposed, um, and, um, and in many cases failing to thrive. So that is our target population, babies that are clinically defined as premature, so they're 40, below 37 week gestation, that are younger than 14 days and for a maximum period of 14 days. And at this uh, point, it's really important to emphasize why 14 days, because it is, it is actually not something that has to be prescribed for 14 days. This is a day by day prescription. So every day, the dietitians and the nurses that work in the wards where we work will access the patient together with the mom and establish if the mother has enough breast milk. And if the mother does not have enough breast milk at that point, we will then use donated breast milk. It's not as if we prescribe donated breast milk and then we forget about like maternal lactation for 14 days, walk away, come back, and magically we have a lactating mother that then can resume her responsibilities. So donated breast milk is very much an emergency intervention. It is targeted for a very, very specific period of time to support the mother to reestablish lactation. And I will give you some examples of this, mothers that are admitted with hypertension, health syndrome, mothers that are unconscious. Um, during the pandemic, we've had quite a lot of moms, um, according to the Obstetric Association, one in six women that had COVID were admitted to ICU and one in six of these have perished. And uh, we have actually seen firsthand um, what, uh, what, what the outcome of, um, of babies that are orphaned uh, through, from the pandemic has on, on, on the system in terms of the requirements for donated breast milk being much larger, because obviously these mums will never resume breastfeeding again. Um, so it is really important to understand what the eligibility criteria is. It is absolutely paramount to understand that, that the priority is always maternal lactation. And in order for us to optimize maternal lactation, and I would like to um, uh, discuss this more closely to, to the practice that we have at the facility level. Um, it speak, it's all about how we lactate the mothers that are attending the facility. And this is where most of the challenges lie. And, I, and, 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 and this is where, in fact, this cooperative environment or, or this knowledge hub that we've established uh, with uh, this um, seminar should become very helpful because we can learn from each other and we can learn what teams in certain hospitals did which optimized or supported the lactation or built further uh, sensitivity to the importance of, of lactating moms, especially during COVID times. So um, we... Um, um, yeah, that's, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, 
It's really important that we always, always prioritize maternal lactation as the point of departure. So what happens oftentimes in the wards that we work in is that at the beginning of prematurity, especially babies that are born at 28 week gestation, which is generally our target population, will um, have mothers that are not optimally lactating, but oftentimes will also consume volumes of breast milk, which are really tiny. And what we see happening in the wards at this point is that we ask mothers to give us those five moles every three hours. However, in terms of how lactation works, this means that we are slowly drying mothers up. And what we see when we do not uh, hyperlactate mothers or optimize lactation beyond prematurity for mothers of premature babies is that on week two, three, four, and five, the mother's breast milk supply tends to dwindle. So the first and most important piece of, 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 um, of, of strategy that we share with the hospitals that optimizes lactation is to ensure that a, the mother of a premature baby is encouraged to lactate as if her baby had been full term. So that by week two, three, four, and five, we are produce, producing exponentially larger volumes of breast milk uh, that are in that that should come clo as close to 250, 300 moles week two, three, four, and five. So we strongly encourage um, all health health professionals, first of all, to uh, a, 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 to um, um, establish uh, the lactation status of the dyad. Where is the mother? Can the mother be reached uh, for the purpose of lactation? Um, and if not, how can we assist the mother that is at home to express and store? And this is something that uh, something that is food for thought for many of the lactation uh, situations that we've encountered at the facility level. Our mothers, for instance, that are storing breast milk at home for babies that are hospitalized during COVID, allowed to store it, freeze it? Are we giving them guidelines on the storage of breast milk and so on? And, and this is another essential component of human milk banking, which often um, um, is, un is undermined, but this is an essential component of managing lactation in general in the neonatal intensive care unit is that we have to monitor the cold chain of breast milk and of donated breast milk. So as our Professor Dalput used to say, breast milk is either in the baby, in the breast or in the fridge, not on top of incubators, bedside tables and other uh, paraphernalia in the um, hospital because uh, KMC wards and neonatal ICUs are at womb temperature, not room temperature. And the womb is at, is at 36 degrees. The room temperature is an average of 20, 23 degrees. Now, donated breast milk can be kept for preterm infants for six months in the chest freezers, 12 months for term. And once the breast milk is completely thawed, we want to mark the containers with the date and the time of opening. Um, and we want to use completely thawed breast milk within 24 hours from opening that specific container. It's really important to once again reiterate that room temperature is really difficult to achieve best of times, but certainly not in these type of wards. And this is important also when we manage um, mother's own milk. So what, what concerns me, for instance, when I visit facilities is that it's very clear where we human milk bank who manages the donated breast milk. However, what is not very clear is who manages the mother's own milk. And so it is not uncommon to find a ward where it is not clear who is going to clean the fridge, which contains the breast milk that is stored for the mothers who have babies in neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and this can be very, very dangerous. From an infection control point of view, it actually can, can be disastrous. And, and therefore, part of the, the seminars, which we hope will become um, more regular, at least twice a year, if not quarterly, will be sessions where we can share tools on how best to manage um, the breast milk inside uh, the wards that we work in and how we can support lactation. Uh, also, what we did find in our recent visits to the facilities is that babies that are born full term, um, and that's way outside of our target population, so to speak, are often admitted on day three 
to the neonatal ICU hypoglycemic because we are struggling to establish lactation or we are struggling to initiate lactation. So part of these the dialogues are also about rem reminding ourselves whose job it is to breastfeed and whose job it is to ensure that mothers and babies are latched um, um, properly and that the baby is receiving uh, the required amount of breast milk. Um, it's really important when we are managing donated breast milk to remember that the, the regulatory framework sees it as a tissue. And in such as, as such, there are quite strict um, rules about how we manage it as a tissue as well as how we cost recover it but also how we track and trace um, uh, the breast milk to the, the donated breast milk to the recipient and the recipient to the donor. So it is always very important when we prescribe donated breast milk to uh, record the donor and batch number in the patient file. It's not sufficient to mark it as a DBM. We have to do more than that. Now, um, it, it's really important, and, and so some last points to consider, to remember that donated breast milk is considered as an emergency medical intervention for the short term. Prolonged use is not advised. The milk is denatured. The nutritional composition is not a precise science. Um, and it is also important to uh, make sure that eventually the baby will be on a sustainable food source, a be it to the mother or an alternative for, form of feeding. Uh, so extended feeding is not is not advisable, um, and also donated breast milk is uh, in limited supply, and therefore it has to be uh, distributed as equitably as possible. Um, and but most uh, most importantly, it has to prioritize the most vulnerable population, um, and that would be currently the low birth weight infant, the HIV exposed infant, but generally babies are included in this, this criteria. Now, I'm going to talk to you about this. But this document, by the way, is on our website, which is www.sabr.org.za. And we have a toolkit that uh, contains this, uh, this, this tool. You guys are welcome to download it. Um, and also we can now talk briefly about what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria for um, breast milk donors. So if you also visit our website, um, but I will not share this, the donor screening questionnaire with you on, the, on, the, on, our, um, on our screen. Um, however, we ask a number of lifestyle questions and I also want to be quite quick about it. First, we ask, first of all, consent to donate. Um, we ask consent for a number of tests, uh, such as HIV, hepatitis, and syphilis. And then we do a lifestyle screening where we establish that the mother will not be drinking, smoking, taking, ha taking habit-forming form, habit drugs, or that she does not have any sexually transmitted infections like hepatitis B, C, TB, syphilis, or HIV. Um, we also ask uh, that... Uh, the um, breastfeeding mothers are con um, on, on an ongoing basis receive sexual reproductive health education. And to this end, we talk about barrier methods during breastfeeding. Um, there is this um, tendency to treat mothers that are HIV negative and breastfeeding almost as if they were immunized uh, against the disease. And in fact, we see a lot of mothers seroconverting um, late in pregnancy um, and well, during breastfeeding. And that is a really concerning time because the risks of vertical transmission are much higher during the ramp up phase of the disease um, as a high as 25% risk of vertical transmission in that time. So we take the opportunity to also do a lot of talking about um, sexual reproductive health and mothers that want to donate must absolutely not be taking any me medication that may reach the baby in, sig in significant quantities, that causes drowsiness, causes diarrhea, makes it harder for the baby to breathe, or makes the baby irritable, or changes the micronutrient balance, or increases the chances of infection. So if you do have questions pertaining to whether a mother is suitable to donate or not, um, we have also in the toolkit on our website a list of medication, 
which is available, but we also have support groups where we discuss viability um, depend on a case by case basis because not all mothers take the same kinds of medication. We're also uh, currently um, doing research in the pharmacodynamics of antidepressants in breast milk as we find that 32% of the population that signs up to donate on our, through our website is in fact taking medication and most of these medications are antidepressants like eglonil and Esperide. And therefore, we're trying to change uh, the inclusion criteria for uh, breast milk donation to, in fact, possibly include uh, these mothers, because you can imagine it's quite a large portion of the population. And a lot of these mothers are actually receiving uh, these lactogogs uh, because these antidepressants are also considered to be lact lactation um, medication, so to help mothers to lactate. Um, but if we're hoping that if the, 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 the pharmaceutical does not reach the breast milk in significant quantities, that this may give us the research evidence we require to open up our guidelines further. So that's very briefly on, on what, what qualifies as an inclusion criteria um, and um, exclusion criteria. So, so just to briefly uh, go over it again, mothers that smoke, drink, take habit-forming drugs, um, mothers that have sexually transmitted infections, and mothers that are taking certain kind of medications do not qualify to donate breast milk. That doesn't necessarily mean they do not qualify to breastfeed their own babies. And a lot of these medications, whilst they are indicated to be safe for lactation, there is a lot of reservations about, about, about whether, whether you know, about the extent of this research evidence. And, um, and, and more importantly, when we have asked um, pharmaceutical companies to indemnify our products against their pharmaceuticals in them, for instance, like Eglonil in breast milk, we were not given an answer. So, um, you know, from, from a liability and also a procedure point of view, we, 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 we try as uh, best as possible to have breast milk that only contains multivitamins um, where, where possible. Um, and again, the eligibility criteria for breast milk recipients are infants that are born below 37 weeks gestation, that are younger than 14 days, maximum period of 14 days, at, at risk of necrotizing enterocolitis, we also make allocations for RVD exposed infants who may qualify, especially in the first few days of life, where mothers who desire to exclusively breastfeed struggle. Oftentimes, uh, these are some of the babies that then fail to thrive. And in these cases, we have expanded the guideline to include um, this population of full term babies. Um, and, and that's on uh, the safe use of donated breast milk and uh, human milk banking. I will now share with you a, uh, the first um, installment of a video that we um, uh, have actually, we're just launching this week. It's called Against All Odds. We have sort of done a documentary on human milk banking so that we can better um, visually explain what we do. You know, oftentimes I still have the weirdest job in the world and the most interesting one. And now at least I have a 23 minute tool to explain to people what I do. Um, this, uh, this is, this, we're no, there is no particular reason why we're showcasing um, these two hospitals aside from the fact that Kalafong Hospital gives a fantastic benchmarking opportunity for kangaroo mother care. And the Philadelphia Hospital Human Milk Bank was the last hospital uh, that we launched um, actually last month. And therefore, this is uh, part of the content. But I just want to reassure you that every province that we have worked with in South Africa has been absolutely dedicated and passionate about breastfeeding. You know, the North Northwest is our home province, I, I, I like to say, um, because it was the first uh, province that gave us an opportunity to showcase um, the, the benefits that uh, human MOOC banking would bring to the facility level. And so it's also a great learning ground for all of us to improve on what we do. Um, and I hope that you all have an opportunity to learn as much as, as, as we did from this.
against all odds, human milk banks thrive in the most rural settings. We are standing in the Kalafong Breast Milk Bank. This was the first facility we have ever established um, in the human milk banking stables of the South African Breast Milk Reserve. Kalafong was established in 2008, and since then we raised money through the Discovery Foundation to be able to renovate um, the original breast milk banking room to what you see now is a state-of-the-art clean room within uh, the cafeteria in the dietetics building of Kalafong Hospital. This breast milk bank uh, feeds an average of 500 premature babies a year with the support of three breast milk handlers that visit the wards in the hospital and encourage mothers to donate their breast milk. As you can see in the breast milk bank, we have very basic uh, equipment such as a breast milk pasteurizer, two chest freezers and a fridge. Uh, but really the asset is the breast milk that we collect. And so human milk banking is not only um, an effort where we collect donated breast milk, but also is an essential breast, uh, breastfeeding initiative or an initiative that promotes breastfeeding within a hospital uh, so that we can promote exclusively breastfed environments in the neonatal intensive care units. The role the breast milk bank plays is that it decreases necrotizing enterocolitis and sepsis for premature babies. So as you'll see shortly, our target population is the very low birth weight and extremely low birth weight baby that is oftentimes born at 500 grams. Um, so this is our KMC unit, uh, the kangaroo mother care unit. So this unit forms part of the step down that we have for all of the babies who um, are discharged from the ICU um, or high care unit. So this enables us to remove the babies from a high infection rate area to um, essentially an area that's supposed to be infection free where they can then um, grow. So the mothers are then kept with the baby, so we call it rooming in, and the mother then has access to the baby 24 hours, um, and she can then do what we call the mother care, uh, kangaroo mother care, where she keeps the baby on her skin. Every time after she finishes eating, she sleeps. She's a sleepy baby, yeah. you know, I look at me and I just want to go to bed now. And then she grows fast that way, hey? Um, so the, the kangaroo mother care unit actually enables us also to, um, to get the babies to, to receive breast milk only. When you separate mothers and babies, they, the mothers seem to, to not have enough milk, which means that you either then have to give them some bank milk or you're going to have to give them formula. Um, so by keeping them together, we're actually trying to prevent that and uh, using only the breast milk. Also enables us to get more milk from the mothers and this is how we pool. Uh, milk for our milk bank because the mothers are on site, it's less stressful for them, they don't have to travel um, up and down and doesn't cost them money to do so and then we find that they have milk and sometimes extra so that we can then also use that for our milk bank. I will be so more than happy to donate and I've been donating since basically and helping someone, other mother that struggles the way I did. I had my baby, my twin boys born on the 1st of April, premature, 35 weeks. Um, when after they were born, I struggled with milk and, and I applied for donors. So I actually just used one bottle of donor milk. Most of the time, the babies, they don't even get sick because most of the time, prematures, if, if they're not on KMC, they tend to be cold, they experience the apneic attacks, but the babies in KMC, they don't experience apneic attacks. They get warm all the time. And then the, our babies, mothers and babies, mother, they don't complain of milk production. They always have enough milk. They will never say, sister, milk is, I don't have enough milk. So the milk production is always good on a mother who's complying to kangaroo mother care. So it's a big benefit because these babies, they need to eat and then grow. It is very effective. You control their body temperature and you bond with them. You can immediately feel when something's not right, uh, the way they move, the way they breathe. And, um, 
it's it, it's a really experience and it's and it's very helpful the people here are so nice the things they teach you and they really teach you the necessities that you actually will need to use from home i did not have this experience with my firstborn so i'm very grateful for the people working here and everything that they teach us it really is very very helpful we are standing in the neonatal intensive care unit of Kalafong Hospital, where the true miracle happens every day, where against all odds, very low birth weight and extremely low birth weight babies are admitted to survive the first few crucial days of life. When we talk about an extremely low birth weight infant, we're talking about babies that are born weighing as little as 500 grams. And this is where the value of donated breast milk really comes into relief. We understand the crucial role that breastfeeding plays to the survival of neonatal babies and very low birth weight babies, but also the crucial role that the donation of breast milk plays in promoting the survival of babies whose mothers are too ill to lactate or they themselves are in ICU due to complications of pregnancy and due to failing maternal health. So this is where every day um, we make ourselves relevant and we show the value that breastfeeding brings to saving the lives of the most vulnerable children. So we're here today um, at the Mankweng Hospital um, Breast Milk Bank. This is the first breast milk bank that uh, the Limpo Department of Health in Limpopo launched in 2016 with the South African Breast Milk Reserve. And I have with me uh, Daddy Matthews. He is the Deputy Director for Nutrition for the Provincial Department of Health of Limpopo. But I know him to be a um, convinced and adamant breastfeeding activist in favor of breastfeeding for all children. And so today we want to have a chat with uh, Daddy about uh, the value that human milk banking brings not only um, to uh, the hospital environment and the community but also to uh, the communities at large um, countrywide. Welcome Daddy. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you and tell us a little bit more about what is the stance of, of, of the province and the health system on the importance of breast milk banking uh, for ne neonates but breastfeeding for full-term babies as well? Well, firstly, what I would like to say is um, we are pro-breastfeeding in this province, in the province of Limpopo, and we support, we protect, and we would like to make it a point that all mothers within the province understand how important it is for them to breastfeed their children from age zero up until they are 24 months old. And we try our best to make it a point that all of our mothers that visit our health facilities um, understand how important it is for them to feed their infants or feed their children uh, breast milk. Now, the introduction of the breast milk bank in the province has significantly assisted us uh, to make it a point that all of our facilities are gearing up towards having to have and to understand the importance of breastfeeding. So to us as a province, the value of breast milk banks in our province is going to really assist us to further encourage mothers who are also within the communities, uh, who are in our communities to further understand the importance of breastfeeding, for them to also make it a point that they encourage other mothers and support other mothers, support also the household members within the community for them to understand the importance of breastfeeding. So the introduction of breast milk banks in our province will assist us to also reduce the infant mortality in the province. It will also assist us to uh, reduce our neonatal deaths in the province. And it will make it a point that 
our budget that was supposed to be used for breast milk substitute, it's no longer going to be used for that, but it's further used for other things within the province because we will be breastfeeding. We will be using the milk that has been donated by mothers within communities, mothers within households, to come and feed babies mm -hmm. that are within our communities. And again, economically, remember that these babies will be fed breast milk and they will grow to be better understanding human beings. And education-wise, they will be performing very well at school. And ultimately, the country will be doing well economically. We'll have people who are going back to school, who finish their metric, go back to university, and come back and plow back within their own communities. Therefore, making sure that our economy grows and goes further. And further. So, and, and just tell us a little bit also for the listeners to understand what the value, the life-saving value that breast milk brings compared to formula and the risks that are associated often with formula feeding in communities. We all know that breast milk is one of the best milk that we can ever give to our babies. If you look at breast milk, breast milk will help the babies to grow very well, get all the nutrients. They are fed breast milk at the right temperature. The breast milk will give them all the nutrients that they need. And um, they will also, uh, it will also help them to line up and line the inside of the uh, of the uh, um, alimentary canal and their stomachs also. And therefore, that will help them not to have, you know, problems with their gastrointestinal uh, 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 problems. Yes. Um, and they will be growing up to be better and and, and, you know, healthier. Um, if, if healthier and evade a lot of diseases yes. because they'll be getting a lot of nutrients. Because it's the milk. first vaccine, of right? Course, yes. Of course, it's the first of vaccine. Course. I mean, the breast milk, it is also a way out of poverty for our of communities course, yes. because a lot of communities, and I think a lot of our listeners uh, that, that, that are following um, the development sector in South Africa realize that access to water and sanitation is not equal for all and it's something we're working on. But in the context, for instance, of a drought or we, we, we don't have access to regular water, breastfeeding saves lives. Of course, our, our province is a rural area. Yes. We don't normally have enough water coming through to um, our households yes. and therefore preparation of breast milk substitute will really cost mothers quite a lot and they'll have to make fire they'll have to go fetch water therefore the household chores will not be done taking care of the babies will not also take as they should yeah. be doing so that will cost them quite a lot compared to just taking out of their breast and giving it putting to the, the baby, baby on the breast any. so it will be very free compared to going and going to a retailers and buying breast milk substitute Preparation of breast milk substitute cost them because they need energy, they need water, they need fire, they need electricity. That will really cost them a lot compared to uh, breastfeeding. I think we also need to remember that during the COVID era, we have seen that there has been an impact on breastfeeding. We saw this nationally. We, we see that Limpopo is a very well breast province, breastfed province. But we have seen on the territory that due to the repurposing of some hospital facilities and access restrictions, the breastfeeding rates have been impacted and also because of access control. So I, I think an important role that human milk banking has played during this time has been precisely around supporting babies that might have been orphaned because of COVID or whose mothers themselves are in intensive care and therefore unable to breastfeed their own babies or on, on medications which are contraindicated for lactation. And in that space, we found a renewed purpose. Um, I mean, sadly, in the space of a pandemic, but it, it proved to be quite an essential aspect of, of expanding breastfeeding through awareness and human milk banking. And I hope we'll be able to recover as a country to the breastfeeding rates which we were able to show before the pandemic and that we are becoming cognizant and aware of that um, as we go along. Um, and we've now opened Philadelphia Hospital Breastmore Bank, which we saw last, uh, last uh, couple of weeks ago. In fact, uh, to date has fed nearly 100 very low birth weight infants. Three, two, two one. one.
and breastfeed, they are afraid, but breast, this uh, milk becomes handy. And those mothers, what about those who end up in ICU, who end up being ventilated? How are we going to feed their babies? This bank comes in handy. So I can tell you, I can do anything for women, especially this one dedicated to Charlotte McLeod. We're saying one of the women who ever existed in our country, 150 years ago, she was born, and I'm sure, I still repeat what I said earlier on, I'm sure her mother did breastfeed her. Otherwise, she will not be having that intellectual capacity that she had. So we really are proud and we are happy. And thank you to all the team. Let's continue to do the good work. As long as it involves mothers and babies, count me in. I think you know something that perhaps we can also uh, look at. Uh, it's also the the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis in the very low birth weight population. You know, um, a lot of the times I think there is this misunderstanding uh, with um, the people that are watching our work, mine, yours, and the work of our colleagues in breastfeeding, that think that we are fancy and we like something bohemian in our children's mouths, but. They, I think, often do not realize how militantly uh, pro-breastfeeding we are because we understand its value as medicine, as a life-saving medicine, as, as, as what decreases infection, disease, mortality, morbidity. It's not just because we think it's nice to have breast milk in a baby's mouth, but it's a must-have. If we're also going to then uh, um, and mitigate issues around malnutrition and stunting in children mm -hmm. further on. This, the many properties that it has is the nutritional value that it has for our baby, um, enhancing their growth. Um, neurodevelopmentally, these babies are much stronger. Um, and in comparison to formula fed babies, our breastfeeding babies do much better. We promote that in our unit. Um, breastfeeding is also advantages in the sense that it is affordable to our moms. Um, it's easy to handle, it's easy to prepare, it doesn't require preparation as you would compare to formula. Um, for those moms who are reliant on donor breast milk, there's a large group of patients, especially in our ICU setting, who really benefit. So it reduces the risk, for instance, for necrotizing enterocolitis, which is many of the conditions that we manage. Um, for our babies and especially our premature babies. Also, we do use it in the babies that are HIV exposed, whose moms are unable to feed. And it also has um, many um, good immunological properties that um, benefits the baby and mom. And the, th the most important thing which I haven't um, even mentioned is bonding. The bonding that it creates between mom and child, just from breastfeeding and its techniques as well. In the era of COVID, um, you see, you, you've seen that a lot of uh, people have stayed home during lockdown, unable to visit most of our hospitals. Yes. But we've seen babies with necrotizing enterovitis coming through um, and surviving. In this hospital, yes. currently, we have fed quite a lot of babies. We have seen the infant mortality coming down, and we have seen that babies in this hospital survive and go home and end up with their mothers at home the situation with COVID and the reality that we're facing around access restrictions. And oftentimes, you know, we live on a beautiful, large piece of land and, and tertiary facilities can be far from the homes of moms. And it was in that moment that I realized that when, when, when a woman, for, for, for a variety of reasons, COVID being the primary one, is sent home, not breastfeeding, we, that means that that child will never have access to breast milk. At, at all throughout its childhood and that that really limits 
that 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 child's possibility to survive and thrive, yes. and 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 it's a, it's an important realization. I think we, we that we all have to make as healthcare professionals that come in the next few months, and especially now that we are approaching World Breastfeeding Week, mm-hmm. we have to reinvest in re-educating our our healthcare forces in in in, in supporting breastfeeding, mm-hmm. COVID or no COVID, you know. I would like to thank the South African Breast Milk Reserve for the resources that they have, um, you know, shared with us um, as a province and the knowledge that they have shared with us as a province. And we have gained so much uh, by just being in a partnership with you. And we believe that we're still going to be opening more and more of our breast milk banks. Uh, This is only our second one that we have, but we will be moving and moving forward to having more of our breast milk banks in the province. The province of Limpopo has invested some of the biggest like state-of-the-art funding into creating some really, really special spaces. I know that if you go around the country, and I often wonder what the minister thinks when he sees this bank and then he sees another bank, but you guys have invested in two of top, top breast milk banks. And, and in fact, the investment not only in the soft renovations and the equipment, uh, but it also reflects in, in the, how prolific uh, these uh, freezers are. And at the moment, the, uh, you are not only feeding these two hospitals, but if I am not mistaken, we are feeding four, four hospitals in the public sector and one in the, in the private, private sector. sector. So this is, is an investment that has stretched a, lo- a lot further and beyond the, its monetary value to actually catch other facilities. Um, but we were also really enjoyed cooperating with you guys. We've learned a lot. Mm-hmm. We're working with the Department of Health has been a real learning curve, and it, the collaboration has been uh, amazing for us on the learning level. What we learned is that uh, against all odds, human milk banks thrive in the most rural settings. You know, and and where where oftentimes uh, some would argue that this is only something that can work in urban centres. What we learned is that come hello high water we can make a breast milk bank work in the most rural settings and in the most successful way so thank you so much for your time daddy today and i wish you a fantastic rest of your week thank you all right so i want that was the um, the first um, episode of against all odds which we shared with you I would just like to reiterate again that we have uh, have benefited from really, really enriching relationships um, with the the directors and deputy directors of the Departments of Health provincially. Um, A huge thank you to uh, Tornello and Grace for giving us um, the opportunity to uh, prove the concept and for allowing us to host this event today. Um, and to all of you who have cooperated in this learning experience, um, we have now uh, some more lessons learned from our colleagues in uh, in the facilities of the Northwest. What I would like to say, uh, highlight is that, that that really what makes uh, breastfeeding work is the team effort, and and something that perhaps we can hear more about in the presentations to come is how, how can we become part of the, the actions that need to be taken to support lactation at, the, at, at all levels of uh, both at the facility level, but at, in my home, how can I support my neighbor in my church, in my community? It, it's really important that, we, that that infrastructure uh, that, that is intangible becomes more and more tangible through communication. And, 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 and one thing that I would think we should be put on high on our priority list, list is that all facilities should have a revival of the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding of the mother and baby friendly health initiative. And that we should really look deeply into reestablishing those groups, those technical working groups at the facility level that meet regularly to discuss what are we doing to promote lactation. And that we revive those set of procedures um, so that we can also um, assist our colleagues in uh, in positioning in their breastfeeding practice, um, and, and very importantly, um, uh, to create a, a platform or a forum where we can can discuss strategies which have helped 
um, our facilities or institutions uh, to promote lactation. I do agree. Thank you so much, Tasha. I think to end of this session, um, I'm going to run a quick poll. And in this poll, I would like to know um, what is your, how do you consider yourself in your level of knowledge with regards to human milk banking? And that will give us an idea of, um, of the people attending, but also on what more information need to be shared. So I'm going to share this poll and I hope you can all see it. So you can quickly um, answer your questions. I just wanted to add, seeing that I do have some time, that perhaps some of the aspects which were not covered in my presentation, because we do make assumptions on. I see my will. I see your hand up. I'll 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 I'll, be, I'll come to you now. Um, is that? Um, we uh, all breast milk, donated breast milk, what the quality processes are. All breast milk is pasteurized at 62.5 degrees for half an hour. And all breast milk uh, undergoes very strict quality procedures that ensure the safety of the product in the neonatal intensive care unit. So we have to remember we're dealing with very, very vulnerable babies. And therefore, we cannot skimp on quality, and that's absolutely essential. So from, from a virological and a microbiological point of view, the breast milk has to be in absolutely top shape. Okay, so we have 42 or 59 people that voted. It's 71%. So I'm going to end the poll now, and I would like to share the results with you. So here you can now see that 24% um, regard themselves as being able to be team leaders of milk banks, which I think is great, Stasha. There's your people to go on with. And then 24% that say they don't want to lead the team, but they're more than willing to be uh, um, participating. And then 50% of our participants say that they know little about human milk banking. So now they know about human milk banking, but not how it works. So I hope this first um, session provided you with that information, but I'm sure some of the future sessions will also definitely elaborate on that, and that's great. And then 2% of our participants um, don't know much about human milk banking at all. So great. We're so um, happy that you are here. So at the moment, moment Sima, um, you are still open. Would you like to yes. comment now? Yes. Uh, morning, morning to everyone. Morning. Uh, Sasha, thanks, thanks for the presentation. Uh, on your presentation, when you were mentioning the issue of 14 days, that we can go up to when, when feeding our new name. Um, I'm here thinking that we, we've got... Uh, more than 14 days, I mean, more than, more than 14 days of admissions in our, in our, in our facility, wherein we don't have uh, lodgers. So yes. in, my, in my mind, I'm thinking, if you've been giving this baby's uh, GDM for 14 days, what do we do after 14 days? Because our, our facility doesn't keep uh, lodgers, and it becomes uh, a headache on us, uh, to, 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 to decide, especially when, when mothers uh, gave consent um, uh, for the DBM. Uh, how do you have mm -hmm. that? I, I think, Sima, we have to look at what, how, you know, um, so that there are some circumstances, for instance, that we are aware of where some facilities have had to, because of reshuffles due to COVID, have seen larger facilities uh, close, and hopefully that will change in the near future. However, in the meantime, one strategy, whilst we are adapting to the system, is perhaps to look at what are mothers doing when they're expressing. And when they go home, do they have a fridge or a freezer? And could we perhaps give them containers? And so if we gave them containers and they expressed, would they, we be able to establish lactation? Because the big question, uh, you know, after 14 days, Sima, is what is happening to the mother's breast? And oftentimes mm -hmm. when, we, when we care for the premature baby, we do it almost as if the mother didn't exist. Instead of, uh, um, instead of assessing the dyad, we are assessing the, the patient. But, but the reality is that we, the big questions we should be asking ourselves is what will the, will the baby drink when the baby goes home? Um, it can this, and, and all the questions that arise around artificial feeding and affordability and all of these things, 
But um, something that I, do, I see it's underutilized is counseling mothers that have babies in, in, in neonatal intensive care unit who no longer can attend larger facilities, but often do have a fridge or a freezer at home can be taught. And because they are already hand expressing, they should be expressing every three hourly. So nothing stops them from expressing when they're at home, storing, freezing, and bringing it in frozen. And in fact, this would work really well, uh, but mothers have to be made to express at home. Does that help Sima? I muted Sima, so you must. Yeah, have yes. Um, <laughs> technology is a problem. <laughs> yes, um, it, it, it is going to help, but in, in, I think in my case, the problem is that uh, we, we have mothers as far as uh, 80 kilometers who, who, uh, from, from, from where we are. And uh, bringing in and expressing sometimes is a, is a bit difficult due to economical uh, issues. Um, we, we end up giving, truly speaking, we end up giving uh, a DBM for more than 14 days due to such issues. Uh, if, 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 you, if, if you remember, when Mafikian is, is quite rural, and um, Mafikian Provincial Hospital is what is, is one big hospital around here. The people 120 cases away from Mafikian give birth here. And when, when you are discharged, it becomes a problem. You find your child maybe with uh, RDS or any other medical condition that, 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 that requires the child to be admitted for more than 14 days. Uh, it becomes a bit of a challenge. But, but thank you. Thank you for the response. I think, I think what we need to work towards is that we, find, we, we try and build capacity there are so many places I think we sometimes don't consider that there is capacity uh, to do more. So, you know, if they come, if let's say moms are coming in once a week or even once every two weeks, um, if we counsel them appropriately when they leave the hospital to express at home, they could have as many as 20 or 30 little containers of 150 mils available for us to, to bring in. And if we give them a small cooler box, which we have, and this is all facilities that we have, but if they, we don't even need to give a small cooler box because let's say they come in once every couple of weeks, perhaps we can then assist them to, to bring in their stored breast milk. Um, all, all of these things also take time and resources in terms of people, um, but but I think we can we can we can also hope that these larger facilities will be reopened in, in, in soon. Thank you, Stasha. Um, there's a question from Donis Hakisi, and then there's one in your chat. So I think we're going to do those two, and then we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, Donis, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Stasha, for the nice presentations. Um, my question is actually in terms of capacity for facilities. I want to know, like, I'm on the side of Dr. RSM, which is mostly uh, rural. Most facilities are actually rural, so they don't usually uh, have enough resources or capacity to carry on with uh, the, the human milk. So is there a way in which we can be supported in that essence so that we can run this human milk bank and we make it a success in our district? Thank you so much. Um, if I may ask some clarification, what are the challenges that you are experiencing with say capacity uh, for breastfeeding? Are the mothers attending the hospital but going home? Do they lodge? What, what, is, your, um, what is your situation like? Okay. Uh, like the previous speaker has said, Northwest mostly it's uh, predominantly uh, rural with uh, challenges of economic um, uh, uh, factors affecting most uh, people. So in a way, we, you might find that mothers can't even afford to reach most facilities that uh, they, they can actually get uh, those services. So you find that we can't even reach them at their remote areas. So besides that, even the facilities don't even have uh, those resources that will enable them to, 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 to have such um, 
programs in terms of the Manuel Bank. So we're just having a lot of challenges that might actually impact on the success of human milk banks. So I was asking, um, while I was actually viewing the videos, I could see that that was a very good initiative. So especially for Mangwing Hospital, because it's a tertiary hospital, that is very doable in most of the instances. But for district hospitals, the challenges might also be in terms of managerial support, lack of uh, will from management in implementing the program. So now that, I don't know how are we going to uh, address that, especially in our uh, district, because we, we really need to involve the uh, district management so, uh, management in, in supporting such an initiative. So I don't know how best can we share ideas to say we can collaborate in this way and all that if there was someone who actually experienced such uh, challenges, maybe that we can share for benchmarking purposes. I think the next presenters that are coming will have some answers for you on that, oh, okay. uh, specifically, especially about how hospitals are doing it um, in the Northwest. But from my side, I think what is really important that I want to reiterate is sometimes we have either accepted there is going to be no solution to a problem, almost as if we've made this decision, or we choose to uh, to handle it one patient at a time. So lactation also happens one breastfeeding woman at a time. Um, and, 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 and oftentimes, if we really focus on, on what are we doing at the facility level, do we have those monthly meetings with the pediatricians, the nurses, the doctors on breastfeeding topics specifically? Those are really important activities that even though they don't appear to optimize lactation at first, definitely sensitize everyone in your environment to the importance of breastfeeding support. And those activities have to be um, engaged. Once you engage those activities, Activities, you will find that there are a lot of resources at your hospital or at your facility level where that, that can that can that can uh, offer you solutions whilst we are navigating the pandemic issues and the, the issues around um, larger facilities and so on. But uh, could, could maintaining those communication structures intact is absolutely essential to, to, to the practice of breastfeeding. We mustn't let it gather dust in a corner. Um, and that's the first step. And then thereafter, we can always support, we always uh, support public hospitals. We have launched a double or double initiative last year where we um, don't turn down any public facility that really needs donated breast milk. We just cap them um, as opposed to those ones that are on contracts to much smaller quantities of breast milk. So will you get in touch with us, we can send you some breast milk. However, what, what remains and will always remain a very stark reality, and then I want to draw everyone's attention to, is that if we are not 150% committed to exclusive breastfeeding in our hospital, there is no breast human milk banking that can touch sides. Because, you know, it's only when, when we are trying to create a, an environment which is exclusively breastfed, and therefore, we want, you know, we, we are, we are puristic about it. We say 100% breastfed neonatal ICU, therefore we human milk bank. There is, on the other hand, the situation where we human milk bank because we cannot commit to breastfeeding. And so on the road to committing to breastfeeding, yes, human milk banking can be used as a strategy to support your hospital. But on that road, the, that, 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 that technical working group at the facility level that discusses all the important, that includes management, you know, the 10 steps, that famous 10 steps um, committee that is, a, that, was, that is part of the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding in a hospital, those, those communication channels have to remain open. Thank you so much, Tasha. I do appreciate. Uh, if you have more questions, please put them in the chat and then Stasha can answer them for you or we will address them a, bit, a little bit later. So um, we're moving on to the next presentation, which is myself. Um, so I'm Professor Valma Leber from the Northwest University and I'm involved with the School of Nursing Science and um, on part-time basis with the Center of Excellence um, in Nutrition as well. So the following presentation then is about um, baby-friendly hospital initiative 
specifically in the Clarkson Hospital. So hopefully that will also address some of the answers or some of the questions that you now posed. So I'm going to present uh, two studies for you um, to just show the work that we are doing in the facilities and where we can go and where we should be going. So, first of all, I'm just going to look a little bit at, about what is Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, which I assume most of you are very familiar with. But then what is new BHFI, new natal baby friendly hospital initiative? And what does that mean in the South African context? And then a following study that we then started to see how, in Clarkson Hospital specifically, how can we get breastfeeding going again in the hospital? What, are the, what do we know about it at the moment? So if we talk about BHFI, then we know that perinatal care is very important because it improves the outcomes for mothers and newborns. And the essential aspect in this is successful breastfeeding. So the WHO launched uh, BHFI in 1990 uh, with the Innocenti Declaration. And this declaration specifically stated the protection, promotion and support of breastfeeding um, for all mothers and babies. And it's actually designed for healthy newborns, and it, but it's also relevant to neonatal units. And we see now when we talk about high risk babies that um, breastfeeding is it's just the thing. It's the first vaccination, like Stasha said. It's the first medicine that your baby have, and it's so protective. So that's very important. So following this, there was an international study with 36 countries on um, what is the status of baby-friendly hospital initiative, but specifically towards the neonatal wards. And um, South Africa participated in this study. So the guiding principle was to look at what's happening in the neonatal wards and it's based on three guiding principles and the 10 steps to, um, to breastfeeding to protect, promote and support breastfeeding. And this study uh, and initiative also made educational materials available for decision makers and staff um, and we've tried to share it with the participating hospitals but I'll, I'll elaborate on that just in a moment more. So new baby uh, friendly hospital initiative is based on the original baby friendly hospital initiative that we all know and that have been developed by WHO and UNICEF. But this larger study then aimed to assess the compliance with new uh, baby friendly hospital initiatives or recommendations within the neonatal wards in a selected set of countries or regions. Um, and then to have an international comparison of the level of implementation of new BHFI in the different countries. So taking this largest study, um, South Africa then participated, and I'll share, share the stats with you in a moment. Um, and this larger study was a quantitative design cross-sectional survey. It just means that um, we worked with numbers and we did a survey uh, at one point in time. So we looked at the compliance, the practices and the po uh, policies as measured by the neonatal staff themselves. So what does the neonatal staff say um, how do they do on baby friendly and, and how good are they at it? So new BHF is in the expansion of baby friendly to special situations such as sick and preterm babies and their families where we know breastfeeding is the most important. So we also use the international self-assessment survey um, and applied that to the South African context. So like I've mentioned, there was the original baby friendly guidelines in 1992 and it have been updated in 2009. And then based on this, there was a group um, in Quebec and um, in the Nordic, Nordic countries, and they came together to assess baby friendly the 10 steps and see how compliant can that be in the neonatal environment. So this is the, the documentation that the study was based on. So the new BHFI package include the core documents. So there's two articles that's been published on new BHFI, and I can share that with you at a later stage if needed. And then there's an educational material package. And then there's the self-appraisal tool, which the units then used to evaluate themselves. And then there's also a confidential assessment tool. So this is an assessment that's then done by a third party. Now, this part haven't been done in South Africa. We just focused on the self-appraisal tool. And I think the assessment tool may give us some um, additional interesting information. 
So South Africa scored a percentage of 76.5% overall for neonatal ward compliance with new BHFI recommendations. Now, very important, I need to highlight some important um, context here. So we had an availability of, at that stage, 187 neonatal wards that could participate in this study. Only 48 participated. And usually what happens is that people that are doing things already are usually the participants that would also like to participate in research and see where they are, how they can benchmark and how they can improve. So um, the assumption is made that from all the neonatal units that we have in South Africa, and it's really a struggle to get a precise number for that, um, both public and private, only 48 participated, and we assume that those are the top of the cream 48 that actually participated, and therefore the high score that we that we got in the study was 76 um, or 67 percent then being compliant. So if we look overall in South Africa, then there was provincial hospitals that participated in different provinces and then two private hospital groups. And interesting enough, the provincial hospital groups came out tops. And with what Stasha said now and the support that the public hospitals also have with regards to breast milk banking, I think this might play a big role, that the infrastructure is there, the, the, the culture for lactation is already there. So there was an 85% compliance in the public sector as opposed to as low as 69, 70% in the private sector. So we also looked at different levels of care. This is now throughout South Africa. So level three hospitals were less compliant, but level two hospitals, getting back to your question of earlier about the, the district hospitals, the level two and the level one hospitals actually did better on human milk banking and um, the use thereof, which was quite interesting. So if we look at the Northwest province, then um, if we look at percentages of all the provinces that participated, then the Northwest province came out on 67% compliance, which is on the low range of all the participating provinces. But again, I need to say, remember, everybody didn't participate. So this was from the sample that actually did participate, um, but it also gave us a good indication of what still need to be done um, and that we can move forward and do more towards human milk banking. So just to show you that public sector 71, private sector 64% compliance. So the conclusions from the study then was that both private and public sector show compliance with new BHFI, although it's still a new concept, it's not something that everybody know about, but the public sector hospitals tend to have a higher compliance level compared to private hospitals. Um, there can be a variety of reasons for that. And the level two hospitals also had higher uh, compliance than level one and level three. Northwest unfortunately performed below average compared to other provinces, and I'll expand on that in a moment. Um, so we identified the gap that we need to improve the compliance to new BHFI um, recommendations. The reason why I'm highlighting Northwest Province is because this seminar, apologies for the background sound, this seminar is then about primarily the Northwest Province, but with a the hope then to expand to other provinces. So the good news come in 20, came in 2018 when there was a new implementation guide um, towards the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. So this, we want to believe that this information that we gathered from a new BHFI also then um, influenced the um, revisiting of the 10 steps. So I would like to expand on that now for a little moment. So the new 10 steps can be downloaded from the WHO website. I'm not going to go into all of them but or, or in detail, but just to refresh your mind, number one is there should be hospital policies on breastfeeding, staff competency, antenatal care and care right after birth. And then there should be support for mothers with breastfeeding. Um, supplementation, I'm going to expand on that now, rooming in. Responsive feeding should be the focus. And this is where the concept known as neurodevelopmental supportive care also come in as a baseline for all care that we do for the baby. So everything starts um, getting together. And then there's a, a step on bottles, teats and pacifiers, and then on discharge. 
So in this slide, the idea is just to show you the, the critical things that have changed. So everything that you see in red here is what's actually been added to the, um, the 2018 BFHR10 steps. Um, and the left-hand column then is before that period of time. So if you look at the different steps, what I try to do here is to actually summarize, um, just to make it easier, the different steps um, and how they've changed. So the original step is to have a written breastfeeding policy that's routinely communicated to all health staff. But then in 2018, it, it added to comply fully with the International Code of, of Marketing and Breast Milk Substitutes, and then still have the written infant feeding policy, and also to add established ongoing monitoring and data management systems. So if you look at it in the new BHFI expansion, then we saw that they kept the original step for that. Then step two, training of all, all health care staff, that uh, remained very similar. That didn't change a lot. The next step then is about um, informing all pregnant women about the benefits and management of breastfeeding. So that remained. And then in the, the new BHFI, it included that a woman at risk for preterm delivery and birth of a sick baby should benefit from breastfeeding and the management of lactation. So telling us how important it is in the neonatal unit to have um, uh, breastfeeding support and um, have that running. Then step four is, and, and there's just came a study out last week, um, a multi-country study as well, that skin-to-skin -skin care should be done immediately following birth. So that was not in the original step. That was within half an hour. Our latest guideline then is immediately and uninterrupted. And especially in the neonatal unit, mm -hmm. I think this is difficult um, because of all the technology that we include. And it's quite a mindset change that need to happen for staff to get to to this point um, of immediate skin to skin and that may include resuscitation of the baby in skin to skin with the mother in the um, in the theater but that's a discussion for a different day then if we look at step five support of mothers to initiate and maintain breastfeeding that remained very much the same step six um, no food or drink other than breast milk unless medically indicated that remains the same step seven uh, especially in the neonatal unit, allow mothers to remain together 24 uh, mothers and babies to remain together 24 hours a day, which is telling us we shouldn't have our KMC step down units in a different ward and in a different place. Um, KMC should happen in the neonatal intensive care unit. And I know space can be a huge problem, but we need to start thinking um, creatively on how what can we do with the space that we have. So just to highlight this, um, no child should be separated if we look at the, the Child Act. Um, and then important, we've, we've done an article last year with COVID on breastfeeding during COVID pandemic. Um, and what we highlighted in this article specifically is that mothers and babies should be remaining together and that we should be safe with regards to COVID and infection control, but mother and baby should remain together. Zero separation is where we want to be at. Then, um, also important in responsive care, mothers should recognize the responses of their baby's feeding cues, and they should take the leading role then on feeding. Um, and there's a, a different article on that available as well. Then on no artificial teats and pacifiers, that was in the original step. So in the new 2018 version, um, it included that mothers should be counseled on the use and risk of feeding bottles, teats and pacifiers. And I think this is important for the, the neonatal expansion area because they, from a, from a speech, uh, speech therapy point of view, for example, there is a use for pacifiers in the neonatal unit. If that mom, for example, can't be there for an extended period of time because of that rural um, challenges that we sit with. However, it should be well discussed. The parents should be well um, motivated and, and have the education and the information on why this is important. So we should use alternatives to breastfeeding. Um, and uh, if, if need be. So cup feeding will be another discussion that come in here, but the bottom line is we want parents 
or mothers then to breastfeed. So there's also another article on why and when to use pacifiers in the baby-friendly hospital context and, and when can we use it and when can't we. And then step 10, of course, is to go on with breastfeeding after discharge. So um, following this, then we looked at the, the Clarkstop Hospital uh, because that they struggled to implement baby friendly hospital initiative so they asked let, let's look at it let's see what can we do better where can we make changes so we started out to identify the barriers which the healthcare professionals perceived in their specific environment and then to make recommendations on the implementation and this was also a qualitative study we've done focus group discussions and we asked the staff what's your role in baby friendly why do you think um, the hospital was selected for accreditation that's we still had the accreditation. Um, what can we do? What's currently being happening in your ward and your unit, and which steps are more difficult to implement, and why? If we understand these challenges, we can do something about that. But if we just put them on the side and we ignore them, then we can't make a change. And how can we improve in the unit? So we are in the process of currently then working through the data and sorting it out so that we can have the final results. But preliminary, we've identified different categories. Um, staff identify different roles from different professional perspective, uh, a lot of different current practices, facilities which are or are not um, the way that it's supporting breastfeeding, general challenges that they have, needs, support and training and, and teamwork. And then there was a lot of suggestions, of course, on how we can improve this. So I just want to highlight so some uh, of the subcategory, for example, if you look at the management level, so it's more than one nursing manager that participated. Um, one of the, the roles is that this is the, the category that's responsible for training. Um, and then on a policy level, these are also the category that's responsible for um, ensuring that a policy is there. But very important that the policy then come from the dietetic department. So this collaboration, the multidisciplinary work is very important if we want to be baby friendly. Um, then the, the dietitians, if we extract on what they identified as their core roles, um, being coordination, training and maternal support. So it's very important to know that all of these are working together. Breastfeeding is not, not on its own. It's working with kangaroo care. It's working with responsive feeding. So all of this is placed in one package. And that then brings us to the point of um, making breastfeeding successful in all the units where we are working and specifically in the Northwest province. What can we do more to make it better and make sure that each and every mother um, is able to lactate and feed her baby and give milk to other babies? Thank you very much. Any questions at this point? Yes, I see, I don't know the name, but I see a face there, iPhone, you're welcome to speak. I think we have Zandile that has her hand up, so Zandile. we'll go with hands up, I think that's going to be easy. Okay, Zandile. I'm just going to give an opportunity for about two questions, just so that we can move on with time. Zandile, you can speak. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof. Uh, Velma. Thank you, Northwest, for this seminar. It's interesting and encouraging also to see that uh, BFHI is alive in Northwest. And uh, thank you also to the Clark's Dob um, staff for uh, taking an interest uh, to evaluate themselves or to self appraise with regards to where you are with uh, implementation of the 10 steps. I'll just like to um, highlight or find out from you, uh, Prof. Velma, if um, you did get an opportunity to comment on the draft um, um, review of the IYCF policy, because um, we're trying to integrate issues of MBFI. We have included a framework uh, for implementation of MBFI in South Africa in the guidelines. So I'd like to uh, find out if you are aware of this. Um, if not, 
if it will be possible for us to share with you the draft framework so that you can make inputs in terms of um, how well we have integrated issues of a uh, new BFHI because the document as it is now, um, it is written in an integrated fashion. We didn't separate the issues around uh, uh, for full-term infants and uh, low birth weight or uh, neonates. We have just um, uh, compiled uh, one uh, document and uh, the purpose of the framework is to really guide facilities to develop um, SOPs within their areas of, uh, of work. So it would be great if we could um, get your comments um, in terms of how well the issues of a new BF BFHI are being um, integrated. And uh, the other comment that I wanted to make is um, on the issues around the use of bottle teeth and uh, uh, pacifiers. In our context, the way we have adopted or interpreted um, the WHO revised 2018 guideline is in such that we still want to, uh, for the general uh, population of uh, the full-time infants uh, specifically, to discourage the use of bottle teeth and pacifiers because of uh, the context that we are in, the other reasons uh, relating to the issues around hygiene and uh, the issues around diarrhea um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, babies. So um, I just want to make that point that we uh, we have not fully adopted uh, the use of bottle teeth and uh, pacifiers. Um, I've had uh, you, you mentioning an article and that yes, there is a room for uh, the use. So a uh, part of the reason is that we don't want to generalize because we do know that if it is just uh, put out there open, it may be open to like uh, use um, in uh, every context. So those are the few points uh, that I'd um, like to highlight and we we'll really appreciate even from the Northwest uh, people, those who have not seen the uh, revised draft um, IYCF policy for your comments, most especially around MBFI. Um, currently there is a threat that uh, perhaps it's like things are falling uh, through the cracks in terms of implementation of MBFI because we no longer uh, doing accreditation. So we want to dispel uh, that um, sort of a myth or misunderstanding that we are very much still implementing a BFHI as a strategy uh, to, to reduce mortality, to promote growth development in South Africa. So we, we, we are, I would say I'm actually impressed that, you know, uh, Northwest is not letting um, things fall through the cracks. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nandile. And just to quickly answer, um, just to keep to our timelines. Uh, no, I don't have access to the documents, so please share. That would be fantastic. I would really appreciate. And then with regards to the pacifiers, I think that's why it's important to know that the guideline says counselling parents on, um, and that's important. It has a plan but if we use it correctly. Um, and I, th I think people need to be very aware of that. Thank you so much. I hope I answered everything. Uh, Tuanelu, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Tuanelu, your hands up. There you go. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much, Prof, for the presentation. I just want to find out, you indicated that for Northwest, there was 67% core compliance. And in your presentation, you have just highlighted Flagstop as one of the hospitals that you did the study at. I, I, would, I would like it if you could also share names of some of the facilities that participated on the study so that we, we ensure that there is continuity in terms of supporting those facilities. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And I'm happy to, um, once our report is ready, then I can just forward it on to you. Um, and then you have it for each of the facilities that participated. But with us, it was primarily uh, Clarkstorp and Porch Hospitals who participated, um, who are also involved in, in other studies. So that was quite interesting. The other hospitals did not at that point um, indicate the interest to participate. And then some of the private sector hospitals. But um, we have um, detailed reports, which we can prepare for you and send it on as soon as it's available. Prof. Lebe, Mrs. Chuanelo Duche, and um, Stasha, thank you very much for the opportunity from Clark's top side. Just to give a bit of an overview about our unit and what we are trying to establish from this side. Um, as it has been mentioned, Clark's is also a tertiary hospital 
having a huge neonatal ICU and obviously even loss of general pediatric admissions and so on. And therefore, we feel that breastfeeding and so on, and even the donor breast milk program must never be left behind. And we want to really get on this bandwagon and make the best for our babies, the vulnerable babies that we have and we're dealing with. Um, so with this being a pediatrician, just bear with me for a while, um, doing a bit of academic background and theoretical knowledge and so on. And then I'll get to our clock stop situation. So if the first part bores you, um, please bear with me. Um, I think there is people on the audience also that's doing research and so on. So I think a bit of background will still be helping um, of the theory of breastfeeding, et cetera, et cetera. So the outline I'm doing is basically why are we doing the presentation, some infant nutrition and nutritional facts, and then actually what we are seeing in the hospitals, and it's not just our hospital, it's actually lots of hospitals. And I'll share that from studies as well that I mentioned. And then just some summaries of our mortality rates, neonatal mortalities, infant mortalities, and the under five, which I think is a good indicator of our nutritional programs, et cetera, et cetera. And from early days on first days, we know that this makes a big difference. If we don't feed our babies properly, we have lots more problems later on in life. Um, even there comes the, the, the concept of the first thousand days of, of um, um, feeding the baby. That's very important to help sustain development and so on. And then just our current program and so on. So basically, why are we doing this presentation? It is basically to be part of the seminar to continually promote our breastfeeding and to working against the MBFI initiative again, although the accreditation is not taking place, we cannot leave this. We still have to continue with working towards this. And then especially in our neonatal ICU to get the use of exclusive mother's own milk or donor breast milk, which we know will have long-term good outcomes for our babies infection-wise, NEC-wise, and even neurodevelopment-wise and so on. It saves costs, it saves hospital stays. All of those things can be reduced and so on. Um, also to achieve what, or see what other sectors is doing from our knowledge to offer support to whoever requires support um, once we get to where we want to be. Um, and then, the targets, as we said, the mortality rates, we will explain that in slides coming, and to create the awareness of the benefits of exclusive breastfeeding in these babies and so on. So just short, some summaries on infant and child nutrition, where do we really can intervene? And antenatally, we must already start with creating the awareness and correct information um, regarding breastfeeding and so on for the mothers, because a lot of misinformation is out there that if you are RVD active, you don't have to breastfeed. There is alternatives, et cetera, et cetera. We can get by those without changing. Um, obviously our neonatal age, poor late initiation of breastfeeding, lots of problems, um, especially our premature babies, growth failure, extra uterine growth failure, Lots of those babies have long-term complications. And then under one year for especially our um, children that has even born full term, but poor nutrition, mixed feedings, early cessation of breastfeeding and so on, all the consequences of malnourishments and the syndromes that goes uh, um, hand in hand with those. And then, yeah, even later on, teenage girls, teenage boys, all these metabolic syndromes and so on that we know has basis in early nutritional deprivation and so on. So optimal infant and young child feeding practices run, rank amongst the most effective interventions to improve child health, short term and long term, and especially neurodevelopmental outcome. And I mean, neurodevelopment is one of my passions, so we must food feed early feed properly to grow good and to grow properly and so on. 
Um, if you can see, it is estimated that suboptimal breastfeeding, especially non-exclusive breastfeeding in the first six of month, six months of life, has huge detrimental effects, 1.4 million deaths annually worldwide, and add 10% of this disease burden in children younger than five years. So just some nutritional facts. Um, yeah, most probably everybody knows these things, but when you have to promote breast milk to a new young mother, or you want to convince somebody to donate breast milk, use these facts. Tell them, this is why we want your breast milk. We know the colostrum is rich in the cells, the antibodies, the immunoglobulins, the vitamins, and it contains everything in exactly the correct quantities, carbs, proteins, vitamins, everything is very important. Um, these babies, especially the prem babies, we don't have immu Im immune systems that's developed. And with these proteins and so on, the lactalbumins and so on that's in, in the breast milk, that protects our babies already. Like they say, the first immunization is your first gallop of breast milk. So that's important. We can tell them there's enough fat in the sugars in there. It's good sugars and then the proteins and so on. And that's where later on in the talk, I'll show some of this late initiation of feeds is that we are actually creating protein energy malnutrition in our prems as well. Um, although not per definition as a severe acute malnutrition, but they, they, they qualify for that. Um, infections and all of those things we have mentioned already. So what we see in, in the hospitals, and it's not just in Clarksdorp Hospital, the studies I will show, there's studies from Ethiopia, studies from America and so on. It is basically the same things that we see all over and it is due to poor late nutritional initiation and so on. So on the neonatal side, we see a hypoglycemic admission. Stasha has already alluded to that. Um, babies with um, breast milk or breastfeeding jaundice, acute kidney injuries with electrolyte imbalances, um, prolonged stays in the small babies, low birth weight babies. Obviously, the, the main worry for the extreme low birth weights and low birth weights is necrotizing enterocolitis. We know that even the small for gestational age babies do have postnatal growth restriction with long-term metabolic implications and so on. And then obviously increased costs and so on because of increased sepsis and so on. After one year to after one month to one year beyond, even the full-term babies and so on, we see that the use of formula and the complications that go hand in hand like that already, the diarrheas, um, they come in with severe acute malnutrition and so on. And we know that developmental outcomes is also um, worse in these babies that don't gain weight properly, um, especially if they lack vitamins, if they use cow's milk, et cetera, et cetera, earlier on, iron deficiencies and so on. Um, just a study from America, William Hay, where they did look at the late nutritional support. And if we fail to provide nutritional support, we have increased morbidity and less than optimal nutrition. The benefits are long lasting, particularly to prevent later life in, and chronic diseases. And this is a study from 2018. So you can see even in the first world countries, this is still a problem. We must feed early and continue with breastfeeding. Um, a study that I alluded to in Ethiopia, the same thing. They had a high incidence of extrauterine growth retardation observed purely because of lack of breast milk, not initiation early enough, et cetera, et cetera. So as I said, it's a worldwide phenomenon. This is a very old study, but just to show you what babies in uterus would grow like if they grow on the 50th centile. If this baby is born at 24 weeks, 28 weeks, or even 30 weeks, can you see that they fall behind the 50th centile for growth already? And they actually never achieve those lines again um, later on. So the green lines that I've just added here is just, I've just moved them. It's just one of our babies that we plotted here in our ICU. And you can see what 
time delays it took this baby to get back to birth weight. I mean, and even now the growth later on in life is going to be much more hampered and worrisome for this baby. So, alluding to the mortality rates, why we want to improve all the feedings, re reduce the infections, promote the growth and so on, because the neonatal mortality rates worldwide, infant mortality rates and under five mortality rates still is high and we still want to work towards aiming to get these mortality rates down. Northwest province rates, I'm not 100% sure if it's all available, but we can look into that. So coming back to quickly what we are doing in Clarksville Hospital. In 2017, we tried to start using donor breast milk. We contact the breast milk bank and the nutritional division of health, Department of Health. It was suggested to use the milk bank from Poch. We tried it for a couple of months. The volumes of breast milk in Clarksdorp needed was just way too large. We had other problems of transport, logistics, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't contribute to Pochestrum's bulk bank, so this, the, the stock was not always sufficient and so on. And as you can see in a busy unit like ours where we have between 110 to 130 babies admitted every month, with a high percentage of low birth weights and very low birth weights, we need breast milk, we don't need formula and so on. So in December, 2020, we were contacted from the breast milk reserve, Stasha and the Department of Health. And we set up a meeting with the dream team starting there with our assistant managers, operational managers, even all the pediatric consultants and all our medical doctors is on board. Um, Stasha introduced to us this double or double program where they sponsored two extra hospitals. We received initiation and training on this first contact session. We got teams where we coined them as champions, not meaning they're the best, but they are just the identified people to be coordinating and get everybody on, on board for every shift that was working so that every shift there is somebody working towards facilitating use of donor milk or exclusive breast milk and so on. So we received milk from the breast bank in Johannesburg every two weeks, bottles of 20 per batch. Um, initially, the glitches of ordering and so on was quickly overcome as we got the hang of these things. And then the record keeping and the, the, the administration and so on was again reiterated by training from the breast bank with all Stasha's help and so on. So February 2021, Another breast bank training seminar came. All the coordinators, extra nursing staff, everybody was present. And it was really nice to see so many people being so positive about doing the, the, the continual outreach to keep breastfeeding going and to promote breastfeeding and so on. So we even created groups on WhatsApp for communication, asking questions if somebody didn't know what to do and so on. We received the fridge from the breast milk reserve um, and we were started to get recruiting of donors in our area from um, private as well as from the, the public sector and so on. We got permission from our hospital management. We have to get everybody involved to initiate the collections. Um, on ward rounds, we re-emphasize with doctors, with nursing and so on to start immediately early breastfeeding the earlier we start, the earlier we discuss with the mothers and so on to, to this, the, decide on the um, breastfeeding or whether we can use donor breast milk if those mothers can't um, give us milk immediately. Um, we got the doctors and the nursing staff to sign early consent by the mothers that we know these babies qualify for, for use of donor breast milk. And as soon as that is signed, then usually the people are much quicker on board to, to utilize breast milk and so on. And then in April of this year, we started collecting our first batches of breast milk from three donations, three, um, three donated mothers, two in private and one in public. And this we sent through to S the, the breast milk reserve off for testing and pasteurization. And in May 20, 
21, 26 of May, we got our first batch of locally collected donor breast milk back from the breast milk bank to use in our neonatal ICU. And it is nice to see that the volume of breast milk that we got back has boosted our supplies and so on that we don't have to request so frequently from the breast bank. I mean, obviously, this will have to be continual to, to maintain and to sustain the function of, of, of the neonatal ICU for with breast, back, breast milk and so on. Um, we are now collecting on a two-weekly basis from our donors and we're sending them to Johannesburg. And I think our next collection is going through either today or tomorrow. Um, so in 2021, May, we had another meeting with all the role players in the hospital as well, um, visiting Potsdam, Truem, meeting all their team players as well. Discussion with Department of Health um, on whose work is it to initiate breastfeeding in, in labor rooms, postnatal, et cetera, et cetera. How can we get more people involved to get milk from the mothers and start lactation and um, expressing earlier post-delivery and so on? Um, we even discussed at that meeting in Potsdam to get community centers on board and so on. And then we want to, at that discussion, also mention to when the new service level agreement is signed to try and get a fully fledged, fully functional breast milk bank, the second one um, on this side in the Kenneth Kahunda district, maybe in, in Clarksville Hospital. So as you can see, a lot of meetings has been going on and we are really working hard. And the full team is working continually. We've decided we're gonna have meetings on a two weekly basis. If things are flowing, we're getting better and so on. Then we will start doing the meetings maybe once a month and so on. But we had a meeting with all the other allies as well, getting the dietitians on board, discussing with breast, um, breastfeeding with mothers, um, helping with breastfeeding, speech therapy must be involved, correct latching and expressing, and they, you know, the, the support from speech therapy with feeding, cup feeding, even the transitioning from nasogastric tube feeding to oral feeds is invaluable. We cannot do it by ourselves, so we need a full team to start doing all of these things. Um, even with these allies, we've discussed some possibility of lactation consultants coming from their ranks. There is people already in those departments doing the course of lactation consultant, et cetera, et cetera. So we are looking forward to that and really excited that sooner or later we will have that um, facility to us as well. P another suggestion to go on a drive in the media, social media, radio media to inform the public on breastfeeding, all to promote our program here at Clarksdorp Hospital. Obviously, we'll have to involve the provincial health hospital management, and we will get our community centers as well, our, our primary community and, and healthcare centers to recruit donators and most probably later on even collection points for us to make our um, facilities bigger and get enough volumes of breast milk and so on. So our plan for the future, to sustain or expand and collect fully to sustain our own needs and then to eventually give to other units and centers that need. And all these pieces of this puzzle must come together. And if you have a team like that, that I've got up there, and that's only one quarter of the team, the team is huge and they all are very, very um, positive about it. And like the one Dr. Dr. Simmons mentioned, teamwork makes the dream work. So this theme is continuing. It is an ongoing problem that we have to work on to, to make our lives better for the babies. So just to conclude, we have to enhance breastfeeding. We must create awareness of breastfeeding and donor expressing for um, use in the ICUs and the neonatal ICUs. And to improve our nutrition from our general pediatric population to, include, to improve the outcomes for later in life. And then just as conclusion, there's some examples of social media of other breast banks making um, awareness through social medias on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And then just one last thing, which 
by pure accident, I read last night um, that scientists says they've made the first human breast milk in a lab. And I don't hope these people think they're going to replace our breast milk reserves. We are going to utilize our people and we will first have to see what this brings. So with that in short, thank you, Velma, and thank you for the um, opportunity to do this presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Kustara. That was so informative. Um, I, again, learned new things. And on that um, article that you've mentioned, luckily they did say that at, at the end, they cannot, cannot um, do everything that breast milk can do, but it will be better than formula. So breast milk bags will never be replaced. I don't see that happening. For our next presentation, um, I would like to invite the team from um, Rustenburg. Um, and uh, Vukosi, you made a very nice, or you and your team made a very nice video for us, which I'm going to share now. And um, let's have a look at that. Just get the technology going. Here's my video. Great. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, my name is Vukosim Simiki, Chief Dietitian at JST Hospital. I'm here with uh, two of my colleagues. We are having Sister Shalati uh, Malakwani. She is the breast milk bank coordinator, and we are having uh, Muntaha Malik. She is a dietitian that is working in the neonatal uh, unit and supporting the breast milk bank as well. So uh, we will be talking to you guys about how we are structured. So we'll start with the fridges that we have there next to the door. Uh, we're having a fridge with uh, unpasteurized milk, uh, and that's how filled it is showing how much great work is being put to this by Sister Shalati. And then we're also having the next fridge that is uh, your pasteurized milk. Uh, it's not as much as the other one because at this point in time, there is not much need for that. So, as we have said, um, we have uh, our fridge that has uh, unpasteurized milk, like it's labeled, and this is pasteurized, and this is our pasteurizer. So milk moves like this, it moves from and pasteurized fridge and then it goes to a pasteurizer then it comes to here where we store our milk so i want to talk about how we collect um, our milk where is our milk from how do we hustle our milk um, um this breast milk bank is uh, situated in Renetal Ward here in jst it's what eight whereby uh, our mothers are coming from if they are discharged already they're coming from home then they bring in uh, express milk for their own babies. But with this process, we look at uh, how much are they bringing for their baby, what is the demand of the baby per day. And then sometimes we, we, we do notice that we have mothers that have access milk, and then we take them through the process of donating. We cancel them, we let them know, we give them pamphlets, and then we give them bottles if they're eligible to, to donate. So that's how we are collecting our milk. It's from our own mothers. And then the, the, the other important thing is we take advantage of the beneficiaries. If your child, if, if, the, if one baby was, um, was on donated milk, then it's easy for the mother to, to donate back because we just say to her, as much as you, you benefited, your baby benefited from the donated milk, um, if you have excess milk, this is how you help another baby also. So that's how we collect milk. Though we do have some few donors um, that are external donors. They are the women that uh, didn't deliver in our facility, but they found out about uh, the services we are rendering here. So just to quickly touch on the stats, we have an average number of 32 babies a month who receive DBM, and our average number of donor mothers is three. Um, our, uh, the recipients of our DBM are incredibly high at times, um, it can be more than 30 and this is because our hospital does not have large facilities for mothers and therefore transport and the cost of transport being issues for mothers where they do not always uh, manage to come through to bring the EBM and in order to provide uh, prevent necrotizing enterocolitis and other complications we, we want to give the baby DBM. The whole initiative that is breast milk banking is in line with supporting, protecting and promoting breastfeeding. So, as you can see, we are having our unpasteurized milk being uh, packed as it is. We have had challenges at times where 
we did not have enough milk uh, being donated. And that was a challenge at the time when we did not have a breast milk bank coordinator. So ever since our coordinator came in, some of these challenges that uh, we faced previously have been identified and are continuously being identified so that we can improve uh, the banking and uh, improve in the feeding of babies. The other thing uh, to note and something that we are proud of is that ever since she came in, uh, the breastfeeding rates of the mothers within our institution have gone up. And this obviously is linked to the number of times where we did not have uh, donated breast milk in the previous uh, times as compared to now where we are actually having uh, donated breast milk all the time. Okay, so there are currently a variety of challenges that we are facing, but our number one challenge being the lack of lodging facilities for our mothers. This has a tremendous impact on the breastfeeding rates within our institution. It's one of the main factors um, that are affecting the, the, the breastfeeding rates. And we are actually working towards finding lodging facilities for our mother within the institution, but due to COVID, um, and other issues, um, the process has been a bit delayed and we are hoping that one day we do have lots of facilities for our mothers. But yeah, that's why also the use of DVM is so high in our institution because mothers are unable to lodge here and provide the express breast milk for their babies. And that problem in hand um, of not having a, a facility to accommodate our breastfeeding mothers, um, we tend to have a transport issue again uh, as a challenge because um, if we we are able to, to get a donor and then that donor is staying a little bit far we must go and fetch that milk so sometimes because of the challenges we have in our institution sometimes it's hard to go and reach out because of transport issues so this transport issue um, has even led to more challenges because you will find um, uh, let me give you a scenario. Maybe I'm having a donor and she's a teacher. She's working uh, during the day and she's only off during weekends. Then it tends to be very challenging to go and collect milk from her because she's only available after hours and only during the weekend. And um, with donors, you can only depend on, on their schedule. You can't give them time to say, I'll be there at three. And my transport will be only maybe available at three but I can't, I can't just go there when she's not available. So that's the main challenge with um, external donors. Next challenge of, on our list is the poor understanding or the lack of knowledge with regards to donated breast milk. So with this awareness not taking place as much as we wanted and with now COVID being a problem, uh, they lead us to a point where mothers do not understand the importance of uh, breast milk or the importance of donated breast milk. So some mothers would not want their babies to be uh, fed someone else's milk, but at the same time, other mothers will also, will also be reluctant to donate their own breast milk to other, uh, for other babies to benefit from them. So now the strategies that we have planned or that we want to take part in is to engage such things or involve the media things like Facebook, uh, your local radio stations, so that we can share the information. And also to engage with the primary health care clinics so that when we are there, we in service the sisters uh, so that they can incorporate this information when they're doing their educations for mothers during the A and C. So this is something that we think uh, might benefit all the healthcare professionals in the primary healthcare setting and also the mothers that would end up seeing in our hospital. Some of the success stories that we have is, at this point in time, we have over six months not uh, receiving or even calling SABR for uh, donation of milk. Instead, they are the ones at times calling us to ask for donated milk. And at times, uh, we are also supporting our sister hospital or our cousin hospitals like your breasts, uh, as and when they do need uh, donated breast milk. So I would say that is a success story for our institution. As much as there are challenges, the breast milk bank in JST is doing exceptionally well 
especially since we have a breast milk coordinator uh, that has joined us. The other thing that we have learned, especially with the engagement, uh, I think it was a few weeks back, it's the teams that are supposed to be there. To have the pediatrician, to have the dietitian, to have the breast milk bank coordinator, the OPM, together working as a committee. So in that regard, we are going to start having meetings and formulate a structure or a committee that is going to be coordinating all this. But also importantly, we think that it would be important for something like this to be coordinated well from different structures. It can be from the private sector, it can be from the provincial department, so that all this information, the support that we should be getting from it, it should be that all health professionals are having the same understanding. And that way, it would reduce the load in terms of the coordinator having to go out and source or even find uh, donors. And as much as we are having uh, pro bigger problems like not having larger facilities, those mothers that are out there and are actually going to clinics would be really, really important uh, for them to come into the institution and donate or even donate to the nearest clinics and we have a coordinated system that is going to assist us in collecting that milk so that we can benefit those little ones that we have. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it was very informative and it's so nice to see how the breast milk bank actually work. I'm very excited about that because um, like Stasha said earlier, we talk about these things, but sometimes people struggle to actually grasp what we are actually doing. Stasha, I see your video is on. Would you like to make a quick comment before Poch go on? Yes, indeed. I actually think this ties very well in with one of the questions that was in, uh, placed in the chat about the role of community health workers in uh, supporting human mukbanking. And I, I would like to invite you all to see yourselves as supporters of breastfeeding, not human mukbanking. Human mukbanking is completely symptomatic of breastfeeding. It is, it is, it only comes as a result of successful breastfeeding. So yes, it is the gospel of breastfeeding that everybody has a place in the house of breastfeeding. And, and it's really important that we promote it at all levels. So we actually went into the uh, primary care facilities here around Gauteng um, to do some um, uh, breastfeeding advocacy and to talk about the importance that primary care facilities play in supporting tertiary care facilities because oftentimes in the tertiary hospitals we are actually seeing the sickest of the sickest patients so moms that are giving that have babies in neonatal intensive care units often themselves are too sick to lactate so we don't necessarily have the greatest speak of breast milk. But what, what works for the economy of human milk banking is that often the cli our client is the extremely low birth weight baby. So it's easy to find one or two mums or three mums at a facility level to help us build a store for babies who need maybe two or three mills every three hours. So that's where it works. And obviously, yes, there is a huge role for um, primary care facilities to participate in human milk banking for community uh, based workers or in community health workers to play this role. And mother and baby friendly is very strong on that, as, as is the Tswana Declaration for super Breastfeeding Support, which states clearly the role that communities play in promoting breastfeeding and human milk banking. Thanks, Valma. Thanks, Tasha. I appreciate it. Now I'm going to hand over to Karlin Robenheimer at Poch Hospital. Okay, so our, um, hello, everybody. We are from Poch Hospital. <laughs> so um, uh, can you see the screen? Yes, we see the screen. You can continue. Okay. So um, you will see our presentation is very basic, and it's actually just a fun kind of presentation. Uh, just to give you a background of where we all started. Okay, so when I actually decided what to put in, I was actually a bit shocked to realize that we uh, are already nine years old. Uh, and we started in July 2012. It all started. and um, But we, I can tell you now that every year we are still learning new things. And um, it's never a constant thing that's just standing still. And, you know, it's always the same thing over and over. Every year, something changes. 
So um, I thought to make it interesting, I'm just going to put a few pictures on for you guys to see where we started nine years ago. Um, so you'll see our pasteurizer were, was very small. We still had to pour in the water by hand and iron the bottles close. So um, that's where we all started, but we were very excited about it and also very scared, <laughs> to be quite honest. So then um, there you can also see the, uh, the pasteurizer um, could take a total amount of 15 bottles at a time. So that made it a little bit time consuming, but um, we managed to do it in that time because we had a smaller amount of babies to feed. Um, so as the years gone uh, has gone by, um, technology has also made it a bit easier for us. And we are also very thankful for renovations that were made to our bank. So it looks so beautiful now. And we are very, very proud of our bank. And our newer um, pasteurizer can actually pasteurize now 38 bottles at a time. So there, I thought to just to put you, uh, some pictures in, like when you get into the bank, that's uh, the corridor. That's the door to the um, Breastmilk Bank that can be locked also. Uh, that is the, um, uh, the freezers that we have. And that's also um, a very new thing that we have is um, the, the machine that actually can send an SMS to your phone if the freezer, um, the temperature is changing. So that's actually quite nice for us to make sure that um, the milk stays at the right temperature for, for uh, 24 hours at a time. And then also this is our milk on the inside. And there we are proud to show you our, our pasteurizer that's bigger than the one we used to have. And that's how it looks on the inside. And we also got a new sealer now that makes it a bit faster and easier for us to seal the bottle so that we don't have to iron it anymore. And we also have a laminar airflow machine that makes it more um, hygienic to, um, the, to recan the milk. Um, and I thought maybe just to give you a few stats from September to, de to December 2012, we only had 15 babies. And compared to now, we have 32. So you'll see from there that uh, the confidence in the bank has also grown as people have, have seen the benefit of um, using the, the bank. So we are very thankful for, it, for all the uh, pediatricians also prescribing the milk. Uh, and then I also thought to look at um, all the babies that benefited. So in total of our years that we are practicing it, there's been 741 babies that benefited in total. And then I thought to put in some old pictures. There you can see us where we all started and our, um, uh, you know, all the old machines we used to have. And yeah, we were, we were also very excited then, but we are more confident now, I can tell you. <laughs> so um, we have more, um, the machines we have is, is very nice and we are very thankful and feel very privileged um, to be where we are now. Um, yes, yeah, so that is the presentation from our side. Like I said, it's very short. So, um, yes, thank you very much. Thanks for everybody for the, oops. Where's the thing? Okay. Thank you so much, um, Karin and your team, because I believe that you all work together. Um, yes. Indeed. Um, so you can stop share screening if you can get the button, but it's not a challenge. I'll, I'll move on just now. So um, on the program, well, I must say this bank is also very close to my heart because I've been involved with the team at the beginning. Um, and it's a very nice team to work with. You're really doing a great job. And it's so nice to go to the hospital and know things are working and the babies are getting their milk. And we can teach the students that this is the way that things should be done. So so well done. You're doing a really good job and it's, it's from different disciplines. And that's what I think makes it so exciting. Um, it's not only one discipline that's working on this. I think in general, 
I um, would like to congratulate the Northwest Province at this point for the different banks and the different initiatives that's um, running at the moment. And it really seems like you are doing a great job. So well done. I think one can use this as benchmark. And I'm very excited, but I'm also very excited about um, the fact that you try to do it better and better and better, even though there is something already. So well done. That said, um, instead of going to the questions at the moment, I think I'm going to give Stasha a chance first to talk to us about milk chases and collection corners, because I think that's going to maybe answer a lot of the questions that you have at this point. And then we'll do the discussion section after that, if that's okay. Thanks, Stasha. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I'm actually opening the, the, um, the window with the questions that I can address some of the questions that were asked as we were going along. Um, it is really important, milk chases, so what, what we learn uh, in, in, in the context of breastfeeding and human milk banking, and I think what came into uh, great relief of uh, Vukosi's presentation especially was that it is a question of teamwork um, and that, that the point of departure is essentially lactation uh, or breastfeeding or establishing breastfeeding. And, and I really want to draw on that part of the presentation uh, where he says that since uh, Sister Shalati was appointed um, as a professional nurse to Human Milk Bank, what the really has been the true success is not the increased use of donated breast milk, but the uh, um, increased use of mother's own milk. And, and to this end, we are all milk chasers and, and, and breastfeeding and human milk banking are really not above or below anybody's job description. Um, as Dr. Fistier explained to us um, from, from the clinical perspective, um, doctors drive uh, the resolve of any ward to breastfeed. It is about how adamant we are to human milk bank and breastfeed. And then together we need to brainstorm strategies um, and, and meet regularly as the CLAPSOP team do on a, on a, bi, on a bi-monthly basis. So they meet twice a month and their discussions are not only about human milk banking or about how are we going to find the next bottle of donated breast milk, but a lot of the conversation becomes really about what are the practical tools to breastfeed. Um, and, and, and we hope that over the next year we can prepare a selection of small tools um, expressing and latching for very small babies. We are preparing some of this information with our partners, both in the technical working group for breastfeeding and the National Department of Health and um, in, in the various subgroups that have, uh, have formed as a consequence, obviously, of all our shared passion for breastfeeding um, and human milk banking. So it's really important that, uh, and I, to answer the question also around, um, that was asked by MPH earlier on and about the pro problems that some of our facilities are facing where mothers um, oftentimes are, don't have the means to come and attend regularly. I think what is really important in those cases is that at the um, mother and baby friendly meeting, we agree who the champions are um, who are the people, who are the lighthouses or the beacons of support which our mothers can uh, access in our facilities? Are we all talking breastfeeding language? In other words, are the mothers made aware that they need to, be, to become available? Are the mothers given information on how we, sh we, we express breast milk at home, how we store breast milk at home? Um, are the mothers held accountable for uh, bringing breast milk to the facility if they're not lodging? And are we maintaining those conversations and those lines of communication open with the, the management of the facilities, uh, with our colleagues about what we can do to improve lactation? Um, that Those are really important aspects. The most successful human milk banks, um, such as the Kalafong Hospital, I'm giving Kalafong as an example because Kalafong Hospital has three milk chases. So... It doesn't have to be necessarily a high-end job description. Milk chasers are usually um, health promoters that have um, matric. It's not a high-end um, specialization. Um, and oftentimes, there are women that are highly passionate about breastfeeding that spend a lot of time in the wards helping mothers to lactate. So we really have to dedicate workforce to that. Um, and and in, in, whether formally or through how we organize ourselves um, and our practices uh, across the various hospitals, this conversation has to be had. Uh, people have to be put in those uh, positions and be held accountable. And we see that, for instance, Clarisville Hospital has that 
that drive, um, that leadership that coming comes from the clinicians, the dietitians, and the nursing team that are working all together. And 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 you know, it would be best illustrated if I could show you uh, the the WhatsApp conversations that happen in these WhatsApp groups around who is responsible for signing the mother up. And these are conversations that are taking place between the doctors, the dietitians, and the nurses, and everybody is on board and everybody is part of this breastfeeding team. Those, those were what my inputs. I would like to now address some of the questions that uh, were brought up. Can I can I do that? Um, um, Asha, you can do that um, with the greatest of love. Uh, I think you must just please add on uh, also, what is a uh, milk bank corner or collection corner? And how do yeah. one actually set that up for the people that's here from the community setting? So I, I think the most important point that has to be made is that any any of your desires to human milk bank as a facility in the northwest have to be run past the, the provincial department of health. Um, so your your requests and appeals have to be escalated uh, through the appropriate channels to the offices of uh, Tuanelo and Grace. Um, we, we the way in which we worked with the Clarksville Hospital was that we launched a double or double initiative. I'm all sure you're all familiar with the saying double or nothing. Well, nothing is definitely not an option and we want to double the impact. So we will double. And what we offered all the provincial departments of health was an opportunity to uh, the ones that are on service level agreement with us to identify two facilities that would benefit from receiving access to donated breast milk. So essentially, Clarkstorp Hospital at this point under the double or double initiative is a collection corner in the loose sense, not the, uh, the contractual sense with our province. The province has other plans for the corners. Um, but for instance, in the Northwest, uh, we have Clarksdorp Hospital that is under the double or double initiative. And we also have Brits Hospital that is under the double or double initiative. In Brits, where they are, are aware and cognizant of the importance of breastfeeding, they contact us to receive breast milk. In Clarksdorp Hospital, the need was much greater than the 40 bottles that we cap the double or double hospitals to a month. So they really uh, uh, reached out to us uh, to, to be able to receive more support. And that is usually what drives the process of, 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 having, of being just a recipient of donated breast milk, becoming a breast milk corner, or being a fully fledged breast milk bank. Obviously, all of this under with, with the blessing of the Provincial Department of Health um, and, and, and with the guidance of the Provincial Department of Health. Um, so that is how we how 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 what makes the difference between a collection corner, which is essentially a hospital that is using the donated breast milk, but is using to say, and is so committed that they're also collecting, and that through this collection they augment their capacity. So now Clarksdorp Hospital is no longer tied to that very strict guideline of only um, 40 bottles a month. Now they collect and whatever they collect, we process and we send back in full. Um, a hospital that just receives like Brit Hospital phones us when they are really needing and they oftentimes use much less than 40 bottles a month. They'll need 20 bottles and that's that's what we send. And then they are they, they just use it as any, as most neonatal ICUs that reach out to us use it. And then you have hospitals like JST, like Potchefstroom hospitals that have breast milk banks in foot that are fully fledged banks and fully fledged banks have um, the entire uh, complement of equipment, be it your breast milk pasteurizer, the temperature mapping device you were alluding to, um, um, Carlene, in your presentation, which monitors the cold chain of the of the facility, and the fridges and the freezers, and the and the and the dedicated space. It is also regulated, um, um, and 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 the facilities that have human milk banks would pass the auditing uh, requirements of the regulatory framework for human milk banking. Um, that we are very proud to be um, um, co-authors with the Department of Health with. So. I think that kind of covers it. Does that explain the difference, uh, Velma, between a facility that received donated breast milk, a collection corner, 
and a hospital that has a fully fledged bank. So and once uh, one more time, the collection corner is a facility and a collection corner could be many different kinds of facilities. So for instance, we have collection corners in some uh, private midwife practices where mothers come to give birth and they want to help us and because they do a lot of antenatal classes and postnatal classes, they will have mothers that come and they breastfeed. And so we collect at, at those uh, facilities. When a collection corner is like Clark's Oak Hospital, it it's, it's a neonatal intensive care unit, which is using, but it's also recruiting donors. Um, and and Clarksdorp is ideal because as an urban center, it, it, we uh, and as you heard, heard from Dr. Fasir's uh, presentation, uh, we we also have a mix of public and private donors, and a fully fledged bank uh, like the four that are fully fledged and that are situated in the tertiary hospitals. Um, they're also legally fully full, full on breast milk banks uh, with all the documents and all the insurances. Nastasha, if I'm working at a clinic and I'm motivated a few mums that come to our clinic to actually donate their milk, how does that then work? What do I do all with right. milk? Where does it go? Right, that's an aspect I hadn't discussed. So very simply put, we have two mo modes of signing up donors. A, a donor can either sign up in one of the tertiary human milk banks or a donor can sign up online. So um, any mother countrywide that wants to sign up to donate breast milk would find us on, and I will put it in actually in, in, in the comments on www.sabr.org.za um, and she would click... Uh, donate breast milk. Uh, so she will then complete the form in full and the form will uh, be part of our database and respect, irrespective of where you're at. So we say nationally because if uh, the potential donor will sign up and this potential donor is from the Western Cape, that donor will be referred to our sister bank Milk Matters in the Western Cape. Or if that donor is from KZN, we will refer that donor to the KZN Initiative for Breastfeeding Support. Um, and if that donor is close to any of the banks which are on in uh, part of our SABR Human Milk Banking Stables, then the, those donors will be redirected to that bank. And that happens a lot. JSD has a great uh, relationship with private donors. Clarksdorp Hospital have a good relationship with private donors. So essentially, that's how we sign up. So when a mom then signs up online, we will give her a call and we'll establish that she fits our eligibility criteria. And once she has, uh, um, she has met these criteria, then we will collect her breast milk and we will dispatch a nurse through wellness insurance health pathologists. And this nurse will visit the mom's home, will review the home environment, and she will draw bloods. From there on, the logistic exercise is usually then uh, organized on a collection by collection basis. And depending on the facility and how best we manage the logistics within that facility. So that's what happens. If any of you know a mom that wants to sign up anywhere in the country, the easiest way to do it is on our website. Um, and that goes for anyone that is, uh, for instance, doing health promotion at the primary care level. You just ask them to visit our website, hit donate breast milk, and then we will manage just the, the rest of the procedure from there on. Um, what is really important, mothers have to access fridge and a freezer at home, and they have to live in a facility that promotes wash practices. And then this is something that is very, very um, uh, important um, and something that I had also mentioned in one of my responses, uh, hand expression and hand washing are re have to go hand in hand. Breast hygiene, water, sanitation, those are, those are really essential and intrinsic components of successful human milk banking. Thanks, I think that's very helpful. Um, right. I'm scrolling you through the questions as well. Do you, did you see one yet that you would like to respond to? Um, there was one about pharmaceuticals um, that I had not responded. Do you do, do, you do pharmaceutical excipient identification and concentration level tests in the breast milk received from donors? And if so, how do you go about doing that? No, we do not do that. Um, it, it is it, A lot of it is quite prohibitive uh, cost-wise. And um, one thing that has to be understood is that Tissue, uh, all tissue banking, uh, like be it breast milk, blood, uh, organs, uh, attracts uh, uh, processing costs. And at the moment, what we find is for a donor to, to for us to cost recover, 
um, a donor or what uh, what it costs to re, uh, to sign up a donor um, at home. So let's say I'm stash, I'm breastfeeding my baby in Westin, Johannesburg, and I've decided that I want to donate breast milk and I sign up to our website. It costs 2,000 rand uh, per mother, more or less as a ballpark figure in terms of all the administrative costs around it, the sending of the nurse, the laboratory work, the uh, logistic exercise around the collection of the breast milk and so on. So we do uh, the minimum requirement of tests and we ask some lifestyle questions, but we do not, we do not, we haven't ventured into, into this yet. Um, and uh, a lot of the times our, our donors are mothers that are uh, attending a hospital facility where we do have a patient file available and we know what the mother is on or not. Obviously, that comes with a certain amount of risk management as well. Um, but we do. We are aware that there are there are instances where mums may withhold some information. Um, um, but uh, we, we we find that we have uh, we have not yet had an adverse um, um, situation arising uh, from not monitoring specifically the toxicology of the breast milk. Um, I am a mom of two, one of which I'm still breastfeeding. I follow a couple of mom groups on social media, and it's very frightening to see how many moms feel or are even told that their milk is not nutritious enough. It is a reality that the insidious marketing of formula companies is very insidious from movements like Fed is Best um, that are blurring the line between uh, being a good mom and breastfeeding or the fact that um, uh, that, that, that there is a lot of astroturfing or, uh, or the practice whereby um, pharmaceutical companies will uh, hire social media and, uh, um, uh, companies that promote just specific messages uh, such as, um, uh, the, you know, uh, that there is... Um, we were actually talking about um, um, toxic positivity around breastfeeding, how we apparently make it sound so easy. But, you know, if you look at the uh, movements like Fed, Fed is Best, you'd have the impression that every breastfed baby is malnourished. Um, you know, one we have to be cognizant and, and part of the reason why we're hosting this uh, the, these uh, seminars is precisely to re-educate ourselves and our colleagues on uh, on matters of breastfeeding um, and 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 breast milk being good enough. At the at SABR, we have a macronutrient breast milk analyzer, um, and we have used this macronutrient breast milk analyzer to precisely dispel one of these um, ideas that my milk is not nutritious enough because sometimes babies do fall, fail to thrive, but there are metabolic disorders that do happen. And oftentimes they have nothing to do with the quality of the mother's breast milk. And there are other issues around lactation, which may be mechanical, tongue ties, cleft palates, and so on. So we do have the means of also uh, testing breast milk. It is quite expensive uh, because macronutrient analyzer, analyzing can cost um, ar around 600 rand a test. Um, it is the consumables that are quite expensive. I think I have answered all the questions. If there are any other questions, please. Uh, um, feel Stasha, free to I think it. there's one that I would like to direct to Dr. Fester and his team. Uh, there's a question on what can we do to motivate for lactation consultants to be appointed for lactation support in hospitals? Um, and Dr. Fester, you mentioned that some of your staff are already going for training as um, uh, lactation consultants. Are they just staff in the hospital or who would, how would you like to respond to that, please? Thanks, Velma. Um, yeah, we are very fortunate. They are coming from the allies. They, the one is a speech therapist and the other one is in the dietitian's department or the dietetics department. Um, so, yeah, we are fortunate in that, that there is some hope on the scene for coming that. But I think if we can use numbers, statistics, all of these things in studies and so on, we can prove to, to management and the Department of Health that this is valuable in the long term for prevention of malnourishment, all of these things. And then, yeah, it will justify to, to create a post for a lactation specialist, to create a post like the milk bank in, in, in JST did, to create a post for the milk chaser and so on. Um, I think it is doable. 
it comes from a lot of it comes from the team already. And then if we can just utilize the, the numbers, the facts, and so on, we can we can go to 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 management and department to to help in creating posts, which is then paid for by the department and so on. So I think yeah, there is possibilities. Thank you so much. And I would like to add to that. I know that when Kalafung um, originally started out, Stasha, and you can correct me if I'm not correct, um, but they got um, some funding from a. Um, organization outside the structures for the original two or three first years of their milk bank to run a lot of these things and then after that that was absorbed then by um the the province i think or by the hospital i don't have all the detail but as i remember they explained that's how it worked for them so so valma it, uh, we uh, the, the the beginning of human milk banking was very much funded by the fuchs, fuchs foundation um, but since the Fuchs Foundation, that was only the first couple of years, and Telefong is now 13, 12, 13 years old. Um, and then thereafter, uh, like uh, um, Dr. Ewan explained, um, Prof. Delport um, uh, played a critical role in uh, motivating militantly with management for the three breast milk coordinators and 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 and, and what i find reassuring assuring is for instance when we go to sebukeng hospital we see <coughs> that a lot of uh, hot tank facilities <coughs> excuse me have in fact um um copied this and so there is a lot of hope um for the for 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 that for for that to happen, um, but breast milk breast milk uh, chases uh, are an essential role in the neonatal intensive care unit. Not from a human milk banking point of view, but really from the point of view that if we have neonatal intensive care units that can accommodate between anything between small smaller ones, but like, let's talk about the larger ones, the sixty to one hundred and sixty neonatal beds require coordination in lactation. And, and it's really essential that uh, that this becomes a growing trend that we find breast milk handlers. They, they're not expensive staff members. We are all breast milk handlers in the same breath. So where there isn't one, we need to be self-appoint. We need to become self-appointed uh, breast milk. Uh, we can't we can't always expect somebody else to do this job. Um, and, and I do see a lot of that happening as well. Um, so if you do not have a breast milk bank coordinator, the people that are running, uh, that are, for instance, doing the rounds about dietetics and what the babies are drinking every morning in the neonatal ICU often have to play that role of counseling the mothers on lactation, of making sure that the mother is by the bedside and so on. Did I answer your question, Velma? Yes, I think so. Thank you, Stasha. Then I would like to, to thank the delegates for attending this um, seminar. I really think uh, it was quite an interesting morning and I do also think that there's a lot of information that come out which I realize it's things that we still, still need to discuss and still need to dive into a little bit more. So I thought it would be a good idea to just summarize for us um, what have been said this morning um, so that you have an idea of the way forward and how we can go about I just want to open this. Um, that's, that's the one reason. And then also to let you know that I will be sharing this information um, with you for, every, for all the speakers that did give permission that we can use these slides or distribute it. Thank you so much for that. I will be sending you a link. Um, if you have registered, then we have your email address. So then I'll be sending you a link, uh, next cloud link, where you can just download this information. Um, so that you have it available and you can refer back to it. So um, if we just run back quickly to the first uh, presentation by Stasha on human milk bank basics, I think what she highlighted was the, that breast milk is the first vaccine and we need lactating mothers. That is our main goal in life if we talk breastfeeding. And uh, then it was a great showcase, Stasha, on your documentary Against All Odds. And it would be lovely if we can use that in other areas as well and, and, and share it with colleagues. And the important thing about breastfeeding basics or human milk bank basics is that we need to re revive lactation. Breastfeeding and breast milk banking is not a tin that you buy on the, on the shelf in the store. 
It's really about the mother and the mother providing for their own children. Then um, I did a quick presentation on BFHI. I've shared some documentation with you in the chat. You can just find it there. Um, I will try and upload them also to the um, to the link. So hospitals that participated in the new BHFI have been shared with you, but primarily from a Northwest uh, province focus because that was the aim of our seminar today um, and that we need a lot of input um, to, with regards to Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative to make it something that work. And then I think the exciting part about this seminar is learning from each other, the dream teams. Um, and I'm glad to say that I'm in the Northwest province today because there's so many nice things going on and I'm very excited about the rest that is on their way um, because I'm sure after today we will have much more collection corners and milk banks. So Clarksville Hospital, Dr. Evan, thank you so much for highlighting the nutrition related complications. I think that's very important. We, we often miss that and I think that would be the next step if we talk about breastfeeding and human milk banking is um, what do we what did we have before human milk banking how did our babies look uh, what complications did we see and how did we that change after we implemented breast milk banking um, and then also you've highlighted on the champions and specifically on the collaborations that we need to make a breast milk bank something that's successful there's so many role players JST you um, highlighted that recipients can become donors, and I like that way of thinking. It makes your community so strong. Teamwork also came out very well, and um, you well you addressed the challenges very well. You noticed them, but apart from that, you addressed them. And I think what I take from your um, video is that a, co a coordinator is very important. So thank you for sharing that. Porch Hospital, nine years. That is a fantastic thing. And it's so nice to see how the milk bank grew from something small to something that's really beautiful and that can serve a lot of areas. And the improvement in your area is really evident. On the milk chasers and the collection corners, I think, again, the aim came out that we learned in the basics. Improved lactation is very important instead of improved use of human milk. Um, so mums need to lactate themselves. And I think that's very important. Also to know that everyone is a milk chaser, that you don't need qualifications for that. You only need the passion. And thanks, Tasha, for sharing with us where we can sign up donors. And it would be lovely to see where can we, uh, how much donors we can have from our province. And even with the logistics that people are far from hospitals, that's something we can work on. And that's something that we can really do something about. So the way forward, I think, and I think we'll have to brainstorm on this even a bit more, I think primarily is the culture change that we need towards lactation against all odds. So we shouldn't have formula milk in our hospitals. It should be banned. Um, we should really just have that lactation support and getting lactation consultants, I think we heard here in the, in the last bit, we need that in our hospitals. And um, initially, we always think, oh, we don't have the posts. But if I think on the long run, if we're going to look at the effect of human milk banking and using milk, human milk, what will that be saving us? That may be a cost um, analysis that one can do to actually motivate for lactation consultants in our, in our hospitals. And then I also think um, you shared a lot of things of we see things change, but we haven't write it up yet. So we need that data. We need to say this is how our hospitals and our babies and our adverse events and everything looked before human milk banking. After we started with human milk banking, this is how it looked and this is the benefit for our babies. And I'd like to link on there to, to do with Dr. Ivan on the long-term outcomes, not only on the immediate outcomes, but the developmental care out or the developmental outcomes. Um, we know that babies that receive human milk um, have a higher IQ of at least four points. So we want clever babies and we want to have clever children and people that can work on solutions to make our world a better one to live in. So for all the participants, um, and I uh, apologize, I don't know where you all came from, 
And I don't know everybody on the call, but I hope to be able to network with all of you in the future and that we can build something nice and strong. I know there was representatives from um, Botswana and then from National Department of Health, Provincial Department of Health, the Northwest University, and then a lot of private people um, as well, and um, our clinicians on the ground, people that work with the actual milk. So I want to thank each and every one of you, and especially Stasha and the Breast Milk Reserve. Um, you provide us with a structure within which the work can be done much easier. You take on the load of the admin um, so that we don't need to, to worry about that. We can find the milk. We can make sure that through your network and through your procedures, it's processed well and correct and that it's safe for our babies. And then it can go back to our babies. And for that, thank you very much. It's great to have a, a, a partner like that in the province. I see, Vukuzi, you have your hand raised. I'll give you an opportunity. Thank you. All right, thank you, Prof. Uh, and what I want to ask, and I'm sorry I'm asking this late, uh, what I want to ask and maybe get from the, the colleagues here and also from the provincial office is that who is uh, going to be coordinating? Do we have sole uh, powers to, to can start the teams from ground up or is it something that is supposed to be coordinated from a certain level because we do not want to find ourselves overstepping our boundaries and you know trying to reach out to people in in certain areas where we do not have uh, authority so i i really want to find out uh, how is this going to happen because we really want to stress the issue of having teams we we want to continue with this education and and also the last point i'd, I'd say that maybe uh certain I mean, CEOs of hospitals uh, should also be invited to such uh, uh, seminars because there is much information that maybe if they were highlighted or notified on some of these things, they would take different directions. Uh, like I'm saying, one of our issue, the main problem that we have here is that we do not have uh, your larger facilities. Uh, our breastfeeding rates, and as much as, yes, they are picking up, when the mothers are not in the hospital, when you're having 40 neonates and, and uh, in your neonatal unit, you, you, you are having a, a great chance of these babies uh, not getting to be breastfed continuously. And later, like uh, Dr. Fe uh, Fester said, you, you have a high risk of having malnutrition and other challenges. So, you know, we, we really need to get uh, some form of a system that is going to assist us with that. So, yeah, it's a question and, and, and uh, a suggestion to say we should invite uh, accounting officers of institutions. Thank you, Vukosi. I think that's a very valid point because we all want to go forward, but we all want it to be sustainable. And I think that's where the question comes from. How do we make it sustainable? So I think I'm going to ask Tuanelu, um, as the Northwest Department DOH representative here, to answer you on that. But I would also like to make the suggestion that we have maybe um, for interested parties that are in the process of setting up a bank in, in our province or have a bank, that maybe we get together and have a discussion on the way forward. But for the immediate way, Swanelu, would you like to respond, please? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. And thank you, JST, for, for the question. Just to indicate that the, the, the teams are expected to be established at all levels. For example, we, we need to have a team at provincial level, at district level, and also at facility level. But those teams need to work together. There is no point establishing these teams at different levels when they will not meet at any point. So there should be a point whereby the district meets with teams at facility levels. Even with us at provincial level, we do come to district, we do come to facilities to come and meet those teams that will be established. So that's how the teams should be established. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vukosi. Is that um, answering your question? 
Elma, I also may I interject? I, 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 I think I think what, what we know what, what we what we would like this this uh, seminar to become a more regular event. Um, that where, where we can uh, cre create an, a knowledge hub and a team for you to to also refer back to. Um, obviously, once or obviously once uh, the the structures and protocols are have all been observed, but in terms of a knowledge hub, um, I'm hope uh, I hope that the, the we will be holding the seminar, as I say, at least twice a year, if not on a quarterly basis. And, and, and if we really take off, it becomes a more regular monthly breastfeeding event um, that, that would really be ideal to sustaining um, our commitment um, to and, 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 and maintaining open lines of communications with all the facilities. And hopefully we can expand that further because I see amongst our, our participants are also um, the, it's a national event. We have other provinces um, that uh, perhaps want to uh, involve us in their breastfeeding activities as well. Thank you, Stasha. I think that's a, a good suggestion. Um, yeah, it's something that we need to take further. And I think from the university side, we would love to be involved in um, the coordination of the event like we've done today, if that's a suitable way to go about, um, and really to learn from each other. And we would uh, like to, to use this opportunity to ask people to please network. So I'm just going to share my details again here. Um, so it would be great if you can sh uh, send me an email um, or a WhatsApp is also fine. Just put all your details, who you are and where you're from. And um, in that way, we can then build up this network and we can have a good platform where we can share future events, um, uh, both in the province and at any other place. Stasha also shared her information there with you in the chat. Uh, the SABR, like I said, is a very good partner to have in this because these structures are sorted out there. Uh, all the logistics are sorted out. That's why I like you using them or working with them. It's maybe a better word, but there are great initiatives in other provinces as well um, that you have a long-standing relationship with and that you can work with in your province. I think at the end of the day, our focus is having our babies being breastfed because we know that's the best for them. Thanks a lot, Balma, for hosting the event from, from us uh, to you and to all the study participants. I just wanted to say in closing, thank you so much for giving breastfeeding a voice um, on an ongoing basis. That's all from us. Thank you. It's a huge pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. If you have not received an email from us in the next two days or so, please feel free to pop me an email. Uh, I do sometimes miss somebody or forget somebody. But for that, from us to you, happy breastfeeding. Have a nice day. Goodbye.